Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when, where you are um, attending this event. Uh, my name is Abbas Kadhim. I am the director of the Iraq Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Welcome to the second annual Iraq Initiative con uh, Conference, where we gather to delve into the uh, pressing issues that shape Iraq's future. Every year, the Iraq Initiative Conference aims to serve as a platform for meaningful dialogue and insights aimed at addressing the complex issues that Iraq and its future generations face. This year, our conference, which we have titled Balancing Global Engagement and Domestic Growth, Iraq's Future in an Evolving Landscape, is an opportunity to present a series of panels with esteemed, esteemed speakers revol uh, revolving around the delicate balance of international engagement and domestic development, understanding the decisions being made today will significantly influence the country's trajectory, all at an increasing critical inflection point. With that said, it is a privilege to host you all here in person, virtually, and hope that you will have a chance to engage with our panels and with our content today as we explore the key challenges and opportunities that lie ahead of Iraq. It is my pleasure to acknowledge the presence of our founding sponsor, Mr. Majid Zafar, um, CEO of Crescent Petroleum, and Mr. Abdullah Al-Qadi, an executive uh, in, the, uh, in the company, in Crescent Petroleum. Without Crescent Petroleum's generous support and also complete engagement and encouragement, we would not be doing the Iraq work at the Atlantic Council that we do. So we are appreciative of Majid's uh, support. Uh, Majid is also supporting many other programs elsewhere that help uh, Iraq and the region, uh, and we thank him for that. And in recognition of Iraq's diverse and multicultural society, we are pleased to announce that we are offering Kurdish and Arabic translations of our discussions throughout the day via YouTube, and headsets for those attending in person are available. Thank you very much, and it is my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Alan Wethington. Mr. Wethington is the founder and principal of Wethington International LLC, an investment and business advisory firm focused on advising institutions on capital investment, financial structure, and business strategy in emerging markets. Mr. Wethington is also the executive director of the project on shaping the Asia-Pacific future at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security as well as non-resident fellow at the Center and Director on the uh, Atlantic Council's board. He previously served as chairman of AIG companies in China and was a partner uh, at uh, Steptoe and Johnson. Mr. Wethington also held a number of positions in the U.S. government, including uh, Special Envoy on China, Counsel to the Secretary of uh, U.S. Treasury, Assistant Secretary of International Affairs at the U.S. Treasury, and Special Assistant to the President and Executive Secretary at the Economic, Economic Policy Council of the White House. Uh, under, uh, under President George W. Uh, Herbert Walker Bush. He also uh, is a graduate of Harvard School and the University of Pennsylvania. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Board of Trustees of the George C. Marshall Foundation, and the Board of Directors of the International Republican Institute. He is uh, a recipient of Alexander Hamilton Award, the highest honor of the U.S. Department of Treasury. And I'm proud to say that 
Mr. Worthington is also advising the Iraq Initiative Program and supporting our work tremendously. His support goes beyond Washington. He recently led us in a delegation to Baghdad, which I hope he will tell us about his observations and, uh, and, and, and uh, impressions. Thank you, Mr. Worthington, and the floor is yours. Good morning, and it is indeed a great pleasure to be here this morning and to welcome you to the Atlantic Council and to the second annual conference of the Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative. The foundation of the Iraq Initiative is that the United States and Iraq are strategically tied through mutual interest related to the stability, security, and prosperity of the Middle East region. Iraq plays an important role in securing regional stability and managing regional tensions and in combating extremist groups. Its energy resources are a source of prosperity for Iraq itself, but also beyond its borders. It has held open parliamentary elections five consecutive times since 2004 with peaceful transfer of power. This should not be undervalued. This conference provides a timely opportunity to exchange ideas on several of the large challenges and opportunities facing Iraq. The first panel this morning will focus on building a climate resilient Iraq. It's environmental focused, includes health care, water, uh, resources. The second panel will be on youth perspectives shaping modern Iraq. And the third panel this afternoon will be on Iraq's increasing prominence in regional affairs. As I think Abbas mentioned, today's proceedings are on the record. I am confident you will find the speakers and the panelists highly informative and that the discussions today will enlarge our thinking on pathways forward to an Iraq more secure, more prosperous, and more responsive to the will of its peoples as a whole. To our audience here at the Atlantic Council, or in other locations reachable by this live stream connection, your participation is also important. An opportunity will be provided for your input as well and you may participate through social media at hashtag, hashtag AC Iraq, and I invite you to do that as you're inclined. At the outset, I wish to commend the work being done by the organizer of this conference, the Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative under the leadership of Dr. Abbas Khadam, who you know well. He needs no further introduction. But importantly, I would add, the Iraq Initiative has sought to broaden the policy conversation on Iraq beyond a predominant focus on security, military engagement, and Iran, to also encompass the urgent and fundamental priorities within Iraq of economic prosperity, social welfare, employment, delivery of services, climate change, good governance, anti-corruption, restoring trust in government, and Iraq's unique geopolitical role in the region. I believe the Iraq Initiative here at the Atlantic Council has become the thought leader in the Washington, D.C. policy community on Iraq's way forward, independent, practical, solution-focused, and seeking to bring together Iraqi officials with US, European, and Middle East regional officials and experts. Contribution to shaping the future is our primary collective task, hence the priority of this conference. I would be woefully remiss if I did not acknowledge at the outset of the recent and current regional context we find ourselves in, the Hamas 
Israel war. Brutal acts of violence against innocent people. It does, in my view, require a response eliminating the perpetrators and the building of lasting deterrence and peace. And this conflict carries the risk of even more devastating implications, the risk of escalation and a widening conflict potentially involving other nation states and proxy groups. The humanitarian tragedy is large and must also be addressed. The world is confronted again with the interconnectedness of the countries and peoples of this region. We are witnessing a setback to normalization of ties and the continued elusive solution to long-term governance. These vital questions go beyond this conference but the Iraq-U.S. relationship will not be immune from these issues. And thus, I believe it calls for recognition of our mutual interest, that is the U.S. and Iraq, in restraint and containment of this conflict and a willingness to engage on long-term fundamental issues. Today, the United States remains committed to a strategic partnership with the government of Iraq and the Iraqi people, and seeks to support a stable, prosperous, democratic, and unified Iraq. Today, though still burdened by foreign meddling, Iraq is a sovereign state and a full participant in the international system and global economy. Though still vulnerable to security threats, Iraq is a voice of moderation and democracy in the region. Over the past 20 years, a new generation of Iraqis is coming of age, one with an appreciation, in my view, for openness and freedom, with access to education and a desire to contribute to a new Iraq where reform, trustworthy institutions, human rights, and the welfare of the broad populace, not simply ruling elites, are priorities. These are reasons for hope and the forces to build on in the future. We cannot allow this to be derailed. Discussions on policy and the content of the social contract are for the people of Iraq and those they have chosen to act on their behalf. The United States and Europe, which have played important roles in Iraq's recent history, should not walk away. We should feel an obligation to be constructive and, res and supportive, respectful of Iraq's sovereign prerogatives while building strong bilateral relationships. We should seek open dialogue and debate I believe this is what the Atlanta Council's Iraq Initiative and this conference today seeks to encourage. Last month, in September, as Abbas had earlier referenced, the Atlanta Council's Iraq Initiative organized its first delegation to Baghdad. I was privileged to be part of this group. I came away from this visit with three central and positive observations. Not unique, I must add. Others have made similar observations. But perhaps observations useful to note at the outset of this conference, as these are dimensions that can be built upon and can take Iraq to a new level of governance, prosperity, and independence. Allow me, please, to share these three uh, with you. First, and most importantly, Iraq, after a long period of instability and violence, is, in fact, in my view, a functioning sovereign state. The widespread and even mainstream view in the United States of Iraq as a failed state, a land of bombings, terrorism, fear, and insecurity, has not caught up with the reality 
on the ground in Iraq. Rather, Iraq is a country seeking to move beyond security consideration and conflicts of the past. It is neither heaven nor hell, but it is wanting to deal with practical needs of its people, livelihood, employment, education, health care, and the delivery of services. To, there is today within Iraq a significantly reduced security threat, though the peace is fragile in some areas. In Baghdad, and we experienced this uh, on the recent visit, the streets at night are busy, the restaurants and retail stores are bustling, there have been no major bombings in Baghdad in several years, and the U.S. Embassy has not been subject to rocket attack in the past year. The militias, including the Iran-related popular mobilization force, are gradually being brought within the system. ISIS within Iraq has been close to eliminated. Iraq's counterterrorism force appears well-trained, in my view, effective, and able in general to operate without U.S. participation, though it continues to require U.S. equipment, cyber support, and intelligence support. Second, though Iraq faces many economic challenges, and this conference will discuss some of them today, including youth unemployment and private sector vitalization, Iraq is advantaged by its large economic resources that can fuel future development. The macroeconomic picture in the past few years is reasonably strong, with growth averaging 5 to 6 percent annually and with inflation reasonably contained. Iraq's hard currency reserves today stand at approximately 120 billion U.S. dollars. The budget continues to be too dependent on oil revenue and needs diversification, but I believe the leadership level of Iraq is aware of the need for other sources of prosperity and investment capital for development, including foreign investment, which will necessitate an enabling environment extending to financial market reform, anti-corruption measures, and adherence to rule of law and judicial independence. Furthermore, and thirdly, though Iraq remains burdened by corruption and patronage politics, one can today see the emergence including within its national legislature, of a political agenda that is moving beyond security and is focused on the fundamentals of the economy, jobs, governance, delivery of services, as well as the social agenda, education, and health. No one wants to go back in time. A new generation of leadership I believe is beginning to take over. Prime Minister Sudani is the first PM who did not leave Iraq during Saddam Hussein's period. He appears focused on building a sovereign Iraq, not beholden to either Iran or the United States, and I believe he wants a well-developed strategic partnership with the United States, including in the security field economics, and investment. There is also, as I have observed, emerging in Iraq today, a younger leadership that is not part of the established factional structure and is not part of the large sectarian blocs and is outside the governing coordination framework coalition. This independent vote is large. In the last parliamentary election, both the coordination framework and the independent vote received just under 3 million votes. 
Thus, the independent vote in the 2021 parliamentary elections was close, almost equal, to the governing coordination framework vote, although the coordination framework secured many more seats in the Council of Representatives. However, as we look to the future, we can now see the seeds of independent groups beginning to organize politically. Also, I would reference that within the Council of Representatives, 25 percent of the representatives are women. And the chairperson of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Parliament is a woman. Two closing points. First, I found in Iraq a, a pervasive belief that for the United States, unfortunately, I would add, Iraq is not today a policy priority, and that Iraqis are not sure they can trust the Iraq-American relationship, despite all the blood and treasure spent. However, both countries have evolved, and I believe that today Iraq and the United States are now at the stage where the two countries can meaningfully build out a broad, vibrant, and mutually beneficial partnership across many areas of endeavor. And our two countries can implement the breadth of activity contemplated in the Strategic Framework Agreement signed back in 2008. Iraq can be a strategic partner of the United States, not a treaty ally, but a strategic partner in a very challenging neighborhood. And finally, many of you are aware of this, but I would like to call your attention to the fact that the Atlantic Council intends soon to open an office in Iraq, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Abbas Khatam, reflecting, I would add, its belief that the two countries can indeed build out that strategic partnership and this great institution, the Atlantic Council, can play a meaningful role in that progress. So I thank you, and I would turn the uh, podium back to uh, uh, Abbas. I believe we're about to take a, a brief uh, a coffee break. Thank you, Mr. Wellington. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure to accompany you and Ambassador Mack and the rest of the delegation uh, to Baghdad, where we saw uh, on the ground so many realities that sometimes are not reflected, um, particularly from the media that writes from six, 7,000 miles away. It was wonderful to walk in Baghdad, go to Al Mutanabi Street, go to the restaurants in the middle of the night, uh, enjoy a wonderful time at the American University of Baghdad, which is one of the uh, really great, as Olin uh, described it, as a, an image of what the future of Iraq looks like. Uh, and so many other institutions, meeting leaders from the president of the, of the republic to the head of the judiciary, to people in the parliament, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and more importantly, talk to Iraqis uh, in think tanks and in, uh, in conferences that are away from the political settings, listening, as, as Olin was telling everyone that we met, we uh, were there to listen and to learn about it, and it was really a wonderful experience uh, in, in doing that. So this is the kind of, of uh, uh, engagement that we would like to uh, to have here. Uh, I also would like to mention that today we are meeting on a special occasion, the first anniversary of the government formation. Last year when we had our conference, uh, the Iraqi political parties took a year to form and they decided to uh, make that uh, 
uh, government formation on the day we were meeting here. Uh, we were happy to see a government in Iraq formed after those uh, protracted uh, negotiations, but also it made us lose our keynote speaker at the time, Dr. Fuad Hussein, who said, what do you want me to do? Go to talk to the prime minister to be a minister again or talk at the Atlantic Council. I said, well, we will have you more than once here, so go and do it. And sure enough, we also hosted him here immediately after uh, he came, uh, he became the uh, minister for the, uh, for the next time, the second time. So thank you very much again for, for this uh, informative report uh, and, and also views on Iraq. And I would invite you all to enjoy a coffee break where we will move after that to our first panel. Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are, and welcome. I'd like to welcome you all to this panel on building a climate resilient Iraq, health, water, and food security. Um, Iraq is one of the most vulnerable countries uh, to climate change shocks, both in financial and physical terms, including temperature rise, water scarcity. There can be a discussion about growth or even the future without climate change being at the heart of it. Uh, just to set the scene, last year, the World Bank started producing a new core diagnostic report called, called Country Climate Change and Development Report, CCDRs, looking at how climate and development needs and challenges may be tackled hand in hand and how best to address them. In December of last year, the bank released the Iraq CCDR. And just to give you a hint of the report findings, uh, it shows that without any climate adaptation efforts, Increase in temperature and potential decrease in rainfall will further widen the gap between supply and demand, or up to 11 billion cubic meters by 2035. The impact of a 20% decline in water availability and higher temperatures in the country could lead to a 3.9% decrease in GDP in the country in the, in the medium term, which shows you how grave this impact could be without any action. I do encourage you to have a look at the report and see the recommended policies and interventions for those key sectors in the country. Now, today we have a highly distinguished panel with us with perspectives from government, private sector, civil society, and academia to discuss Iraq's vulnerability to climate change, how it can threaten the country's economic development, and how such challenges can be mitigated as we build a climate-resilient Iraq. So let me start the discussion with uh, by introducing our esteemed panelists very quickly, with a long rise, we have His Excellency uh, Dr. Farid Yassin, the climate envoy of the Republic of Iraq. He's also advisor to the Prime Minister on Climate Change and Sustainable Development. We also have Majid Jafar, who is the CEO of Crescent Petroleum. And he also, in addition, in addition to that, he sits on several prominent nonprofit boards, including Queen Rania Foundation, Kamat Foundation, and the Arab Forum for Environment and Development. We, of course, have uh, Dr. Mishkat al momin who is the Executive Director on Envirolution, and who is also former Iraqi Minister of Environment. And we have Professor al fatah Al-Tahir, who is Professor in, uh, of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT with groundbreaking research modeling work in the field of uh, climate change in the region. So let me start with uh, His Excellency, Dr. Farid. Uh, Dr. Farid, in addition to being the climate, uh, the Iraq climate change envoy, you lead a lot of initiative actually, initiatives actually on the government side. So to set the scene for us, how is the climate change narrative change in Iraq? What are the key climate change developments you see in the country that you'd like to shed some light on? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for uh, chairing this session. And greetings to uh, all the members of the panel. These are people I admire and have worked with uh, before, and these are people who have um, significant contributions. Uh, before anything else, I'd like anybody who wants to be interested, who's interested in uh, the impact of climate change on the Middle East and on our part region in the world, uh, to look at the uh, Professor Altair's work uh, on predictions. I think it's it's eye-opening and. and now, uh, with regard to climate change in Iraq, um, I regret to say that we're very, very late comers to the game. Uh, in fact, Iraq is probably the penultimate uh, country to have signed the climate change agreement. I think that happened in, in 2009. And uh, that's a shameful thing for a country that was the uh, one of the uh, founding members of the United Nations. Now, like you said, Iraq is a country that is threatened uh, hugely by climate change. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first is, well, the direct impact of climate change, increasing temperature, re rising levels of water, uh, desertification, uh, what have you, compounded by the fact that we have um, uh, a galloping population growth. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, Iraq is also a, an oil producer, and so we will be affected by the uh, indirectly, but very strongly by whatever uh, uh, economic developments take place in the world when it moves away from oil. Uh, so in other words, we're caught between a rock and a hard, hard place. But if I've learned anything uh, working for the Iraqi government over the last 20 years, uh, Iraq is really resilient. Uh, you know, I always laugh when people talk about Iraq being a fragile state. I think we're as resil resilient as they come. 
and I'm pretty pretty confident that we'll be able to um, you know meet this challenge as well, although it is really formidable. Um, in terms of the priorities of the of the Iraqi government, uh, well, of course, uh, as you know, working on climate change uh, involves two activities. One is mitigation, where you're trying to seek to reduce your greenhouse gases as much as you can. And the other is adaptation. You prepare yourself for the oncoming onslaught of whatever climate change will bring. Now, on mitigation, we are latecomers to this as well. I'm glad to have uh, Majid uh, Jafar on the panel because uh, his company is one of the people, one of the organizations that is really on the forefront of trying to help us do what we need uh, as a responsible country in terms of uh, mitigation by reducing the flaring of, of, of greenhouse gases. Um, but on adaptation, I think we'll need to do a lot more. And in terms of adaptation, I think our situation is, is compounded by the fact that we are a country that is water stressed, uh, and uh, water stress will come not only from climate change, mm -hmm. but also from the fact that um, our sources of water are all up upstream uh, in countries uh, that are uh, building dams, I was going to say left, right, and center, almost, almost exactly that. Um, our uh, water intake has dropped by quite considerably, and like I said, at the same time, our population is growing. So it, it, we, we have to really change the way we do things. Uh, and the one way to do that is to, I think, revive the Iraqi countryside by peppering it as much as possible with uh, climate smart uh, agricultural villages that will be able to import new technologies to um, carry out agriculture in arid environments. Uh, fortunately, we're in you know beginning of the 21st century. There are technologies to do that. Um, I always tell people that you know the two uh, Western group countries that we can work with more than uh, than others are Australia and the United States because they know what it is, at least in part of their countries, part part of these countries to to work in a water stressed environment. Um, so, like I said, we're 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 confident we can we can move, move ahead and forward. But uh, uh, as it, as, it, as I said again, we're late to the game. Um, the wonderful thing this year is that everybody's excited about climate change. Uh, I, and I stopped counting the number of advisors that the prime minister has on climate change. Uh, I was going to say the more the merrier. Uh, actually, it, it really does add to the to the discussion. Uh, and you will see that uh, now uh, there will be a big change uh, that you'll notice for those of you who will be attending the next climate change uh, conference. Um, because for the first time in, 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 I think, ever, we will have an Iraq pavilion where we'll be showcasing some of the uh, projects that we'll be um, carrying out to address climate change. Uh, and I hope that uh, Majid will talk about some of the projects they're doing there. And maybe uh, we can coax uh, Professor Al-Tahir to come from Boston to um, give a presentation on his uh, what his simulations say about the future of Iraq. If I may, just want to add one one point. Um, you know, the, 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 this being here for me is a little bittersweet, because uh, 27 years ago I started working for the Climate Change Secretariat uh, as uh, responsible for their uh, information unit, and uh, it was hard on me not to deal with uh, any Iraqis uh, because uh, there were none. And uh, in fact, I received the first uh, Jordanian national communication, the first. Um, uh, Syrian national communication, and you know, 27 years later, here I am trying to push Iraq forward to address what is really an existential threat to Iraq. Thank you, Dr. Farid. Um, it's good to hear about the development, the momentum. Always good to hear. Um, let me ask you a second question about more zooming in into the fact that Iraq was a conflict affected state. So, when it comes to coping with the impacts of climate change, how do you see this? Uh, being dealt with differently by the development community? How should we deal with these challenges and how does it affect it, Iraq differently from other countries impacted by climate change? Well, uh, if you talk to people who deal with uh, security issues, uh, they will tell you that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier, as conflict is a threat multiplier. So when you combine the two, then you have a multiplier of a multi multiplier. So the impacts are really increased in ways that uh, make it perhaps hard to, to fathom. What is part particular about Iraq is that we have uh, large numbers of dis displaced communities, 
But I think we should be able to use the new technologies, the new knowledge that we've acquired to address climate change to try to resolve these issues, to provide services to them. I'll give you just a simple uh, example. Uh, one of the companies that deals with um, uh, climate credits, uh, carbon credits, is um, um, uh, Gold Standard in Geneva. And they have a project where they provide uh, solar uh, cookers uh, for people in uh, refugee camps, I think, in Africa. I think this is something that we should try to do, uh, not only um, you know in, in Africa, but also in Iraq for the people in the, in the camps, but also in the countryside. Um, and so um, there, there's a lot to be done. Um, I, I should say that the people who deal with security issues have been the first to look at the impact of climate change as a threat multiplier. Um, it, in fact, is one of the motivators for population movement and migration. And in fact, uh, that's one of the reasons why many, many Western countries are, are very much interested in this topic and want to help Iraq address it because it will uh, relieve the uh, migrationary pressures on them. Um, and uh, But the good thing about having the security forces being interested in this is that security forces are very good implementers. And so if we can get them on board to implement some of the projects that we're working on to address climate change, I mentioned earlier, you know, the construction of um, climate smart villages in the countryside, I think that'd be a real asset. And there, I think uh, we can bring uh, security, uh, security forces and uh, donor agencies and humanitarian agencies to work together. And uh, in Iraq, they have been working together and quite well for a long time addressing uh, refugees. Thank you. You're quite interesting. That's an interesting perspective on security forces being implementers. Let me move on to you, Majid. You bring a unique perspective of the private sector and also one of the key industries in the country, well, in the entire region, actually. So let's start by hearing your thoughts on the key challenges that you see facing Iraq um, in this area as a major investor across the country. Thank you. So it's great to be here. Thanks to the Atlantic Council, uh, Dr. Abbas Kalam, and everybody for making uh, this important conference happen. So I think if we look at Iraq, uh, within the issue of climate change. First of all, on a macro level, our region is suffering more disproportionately from climate change in terms of temperature rises. But then each country has its own uh, challenges. And I think Iraq has had a relative decline far more. So many of the Gulf states, for example, that didn't have water resources, but through the development and, and good management, desalination and so on, uh, these issues are, are well addressed. Uh, Iraq is in the, unfortunately, in the opposite category. I mean, uh, the Arab Forum, Forum for Environment and Development, uh, whose board I'm, I'm uh, proud to serve on, done, did a great report uh, on the water situation in our region. And 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you had some countries that were in a good situation. Obviously, Iraq and Egypt, uh, most prominent among them because of the, the historic rivers. And they've had the worst decline. I mean, when we say water stress, actually, it's, it's really a crisis in, in Iraq's case today. So the three uh, overall challenges, uh, I think the first one is the drought, uh, the most immediate uh, threat. Iraq is currently suffering from the worst water shortages crisis in 80 years. Uh, there are four, it's been four years now that there's an aggravated uh, drought. In the summer of 2023, which was widely publicized across Iraq, we had uh, com almost complete uh, drying up of the marshlands, which was historically the entire region's largest wetland ecosystem. And, and that has an impact on the whole of Iraq and indeed the, uh, the, the wider uh, Middle East. So we saw water levels drop to you know, half a meter, whereas usually it was one and a half to, uh, uh, to two meters. And that has impact on people's livelihoods, desertification, biodiversity, and uh, weather and climate impacts across the, uh, the wider region. We have the issue of uh, high salinity and poor water quality across the, the whole country. And this is something that we heard much more in 2023 than in the past. In the past, it was usually electricity was the main 
outcry, if you like, from the people in Iraq. This year it was very much uh, uh, water in a way it hadn't been before. The second is on pollution, and that is uh, water, land, and air uh, pollution. So we have inadequate wa wastewater treatment. Every day, five million cubic meters of sewage is discharged into the Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers, essentially making them like open sewers. Uh, and that has wide impacts uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, livelihoods, on, on health. Uh, we have lack of sanitary infills, uh, landfills rather. There's one in Kirkuk uh, that contaminates land and gr uh, groundwater, solid waste management. We have plastic waste is a major problem uh, which clogs up extensive network of canals that we have in the country. We have air pollution. Uh, with particulates, uh, NOx and SOx. We can get into the energy uh, sector uh, as well later. And that leads to smog, which a lot of the Iraqi citizens uh, complain about, particularly in the south. And the BBC that did a, a study on the health impacts, uh, particularly from flaring that, that's going on from the energy sector. And then we have an increase in severity of sand and dust storms, which is intensifying, compounded by the the uh, the ahwar, the, the marshlands uh, decline. Uh, Iraq remains one of the world's highest uh, emit emitters of methane, uh, and and the flaring, uh, you know, is visible, and it's I think two billion cubic feet daily in the south uh, uh, of the country. Uh, third and finally, we cannot forget, and this drives a lot of the challenges that Iraq faces, is the history of conflict, uh, going back decades now, multiple wars, each one bringing with it their own challenges. I mean, we remember the oil fires, uh, you know, uh, from Kuwait, uh, and that war had impacts across uh, uh, Iraq environmentally uh, in 2000. And Three, <clears throat> we had all sorts of impacts, including the use of depleted uranium uh, uh, shells uh, by the US military. And then most recently, the war <clears throat> against Daesh, where 60 towns and 1,500 villages were basically destroyed, leading to more than 50 million tons of debris uh, from that uh, uh, conflict. So these are all contributing to the, uh, to the challenges uh, that Iraq faces, uh, some of which are you know, global or regional in nature in terms of climate change, but many are idiosyncratic and specific to the Iraqi scenario. It's uh, interesting to hear about those challenges were very local, and we can see the more we hear uh, our speakers how or even how uh, dire uh, challenging the situation can be because of climate change and pollution, solid waste, as you pointed out. Let's maybe on a slightly more positive note, the private sector and its role. There's no discussion on low carbon and resilient development without the, you know, addressing the pivotal role of private sector. So how do you see the private sector engaged uh, in the green transition of Iraq, and low carbon development, especially in the energy sector? Where it's pretty good. So I'll describe our own uh, company's experience. We're, we're a group uh, headquartered in Sharjah and the UAE. We're active over 50 years now. And in Iraq, we've invested in the last 15 years, over $3.5 billion from north to south in the energy sector, in particular the natural gas uh, sector, uh, but also in port management uh, in the south and the power uh, sector in the center uh, of the country. And I think among the key things, I mean, developmentally, Iraq needs electricity uh, and, and, and water and, and key services. And yet there's massive unfulfilled potential. We mentioned the flared gas, which is a wasted resource, as well as a, a negative environmental impact. So capturing that and utilizing it for power generation, displacing dirtier liquid fuels. I mean, Iraq has diesel generators all across the country. And also Iraqi diesel and gasoline is actually very high sulfur content. So it's more polluting even than, uh, than other uh, potential supplies. Our own uh, example or experience, uh, we've been producing natural gas in the Kurdistan region in the north of the country, which supplies the electricity for 85% of that region. That's you know, 6 million uh, Iraqi citizens. And actually, some electricity is being supplied to neighboring governorates uh, outside of the Kurdistan region within Iraq. The, uh, uh, the gas 
displaces diesel and actually avoids more than 5 million tons of CO2 annually of, of, of carbon emissions, which is actually more than all the Tesla cars in the planet. Uh, so th that gas dis displacing of dirtier fuels uh, in, in the US and UK and other countries, it was coal, the gas displacing coal, enabled the fastest drop in, in emissions. In the Middle East, not so much coal is burned, it's usually liquid fuels, and this is the case with uh, Iraq. But also how we produce is important. For us as an energy sector, as the oil and gas sector, uh, w you know, making sure there is no flaring. We took uh, over a five-year program measuring our emissions, reducing uh, flaring and, and leakages of methane, uh, down to almost 0.12% of uh, production, and then offsetting the remainder with carbon credits, UN certified, which supporting uh, wind energy in China and Mongolia, you know, in Asia, so replacing coal, to achieve and declare carbon neutrality, net zero production, across our operations in October of 2021, and we've maintained uh, that since. So, of course, oil and gas will still be needed, and it's a key part of the Iraq economy. We're very pleased to see the government of Prime Minister uh, Sudani treating gas as a priority, and particularly gas for power generation, first and foremost, secondarily for industrial growth and, and uh, economic uh, development. So it, its use is vital and has its own benefit, but then how we produce it must be cleaner and uh, decarbonized. Thank you, Majid. I'll come back to you about some of those flaring activities and the net zero plan. It's impressive to hear about this starting 2021, so it's great to hear about that and see how this could be also done in other sectors in the country, key sectors in the country. Um, before we come back to you, Majid, let's go to Dr. Mishkat. Again, yeah. you have a rich experience of working on the government, civil society, academia. So let me ask you a different question. So the connection between climate change, education, security, and stability in Iraq. How do you see these connections in the country? Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, the connections are multifaceted. You cannot move with the climate change uh, portfolio without uh, educating the next generation of Iraqi leaders. And you have to educate them uh, from an early age. If we wait until they are in a leadership position, then we are coming to the table too late. We have to start as early as elementary school. We have a lot of resources in Iraq, and we are capable people. A lot of uh, innovation, a lot of thinking out of the box. So we have to utilize these tools to promote uh, an, ad an adaptation policy that will uh, bridge the gap between uh, planet, people, and prosperity. This way, you have a strategy that makes the environment not an obstacle to overcome in terms of uh, economic development, but part of the economic development of the country. Climate change also impacts stability and security, not only in the future, not in terms of 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it's actually impacting security right this minute. There has been a couple of studies uh, conducted to show that insurgency cells operate heavily in areas where there are no water, no electricity, and lack of access to uh, trash uh, pickup services. Uh, I would like to see these as, you know, the security strategies become part of the environmental management uh, of the country. If you isolate, if you approach the problem that we are facing, which climate change, from a perspective that it's purely environmental, you are missing on two important uh, aspects. One, security, because you need to stabilize and continue to stabilize the country. You also need to educate the uh, security forces on how to understand the threats that they are facing. Um, the approach I see for the country forward is a scholar practitioner strategy. Basically, we have a lot of knowledge and background. We need to put it to use. We need to develop a strategy that would bridge that gap. 
That strategy involves empowering local communities to be part of the decision-making process, to have a saying, to have a seat at the table. I truly believe that, for example, the rehabilitation of the marshlands in Iraq could never happen without the marsh Arabs being part of the process, without them uh, you know, attending all of the meetings that went uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, to start the process. Similarly, you have to allow other communities to become part of the discussion, to have their voice heard, because these are the people on the ground. If you deny them that opportunity, you are, as a policymaker, you are missing on it because we need their input. We also need their buy-in to any policy. Last but not least, I hope that we have an environmental law that will not penalize people. So the approach is not that I will uh, impose on the violator the biggest fine ever, but rather enable them to comply with the law. So uh, my colleague, Mr. Majid, mentioned that well, we discharge to the river directly. The issue is not to penalize these uh, you know, businesses, but to provide them with guidance step by step. What is the alternative? Where they can discharge? How do they deal with waste? The law should answer these questions and should provide guidance to people, to businesses, on how to promote environmental sustainability within their homes, within their offices, within their businesses. That educational piece should come as early as elementary school. If we wait until people are in colleges and universities, we are coming too, too late to the table. Thank you, Dr. Mishkat. It's quite interesting, so because you uh, favor for the next question. So you mentioned about the practitioner strategy, enabling them, empowering them, and listening to them, which is fundamental, and I think being people-centric is key for real sustainable development anywhere. But if we zoom in some of the actions, given the circumstances, the Iraqi circumstances, so what are the actions that you think those local communities that can actually help lead when it comes to climate change impacts on the country? So uh, if you allow me to uh, provide uh, a little bit of a background, uh, one or environmental organization that I led that actually worked in Iraq was called Women and the Environment Organization. It operated mainly among rural women in southern Iraq. And basically, uh, educational sessions were organized for these women to understand that they are part of the environmental decision-making process. You cannot believe the empowerment, the knowledge, the background that these rural women had and all of that was brought forth. It's upon us as decision makers to reach out to people. It's upon us to create mechanism for these people, for these ruler people that they live um, you know, in the middle of nowhere, to reach out to them and understand their perspective and incorporating that perspective in the decision making process. You cannot lead from above you have to lead from within. You have to be among these people. You have to reach out to them and empower them, create a safe environment for them to discuss the issue, to share their concerns, and then move them to a brave space where they can take the lead. You know, it's one thing to allow the discussion to be amongst a group of people that they feel safe amongst themselves, but you also need to enable them through strategies, through education, through techniques, and we can start from the easiest step. So what's the easiest step that we can take, the most feasible, to promote environmental education, to promote environmental management? Either way, you will see that this step involves education. And you have to be practical about it. It's one thing to know what's in the books, so to speak, or to study or to examine. By the end of the day, you have to bring it into a strategy, mm -hmm. actionable items. For example, do we have a strategy, a five-year plan that says from this day to this day, Iraq will take X, Y, Z actions? That part 
putting that metrics over there will allow us to see the big picture. The other tool that we need is environmental needs assessment to measure the gap between where are we and where we need to be. To do all of that, you have to involve local communities. You have to promote local governance. Otherwise, you will notice that we are operating on a big national scale that leave us vulnerable. For example, it's very easy to target uh, the uh, electricity plants because they operate nationally. Same with uh, you know, the lines, the supply lines for electricity. If you promote local governance, so within each neighborhood, you will have a methodology to provide for electricity, to provide for water, governed locally by the local people, it will be very difficult to target that. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mishkat, and it's good to hear some of those concrete ideas. We move to, of course, Professor El Fateh. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not hiring, I'm also a massive fan of your great groundbreaking work modeling. You lead such great uh, regional modeling work on, and on climate change and really can bring us the evidence and the forward of this information we need to act where it's most meaningful and where the priorities are. So let me start by asking you, what are the key areas of adaptation that you see crucial for like, the sectors where building resilience is absolutely critical? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, when I think of the issue of climate change and climate change impacts on, on Iraq, uh, considerations of geography are very important. If you think of the ge geography of Iraq and where it's located, located northwest of the Gulf and east of the Mediterranean. In, in our studies of this region, and most of the research in my group focus on regional scale studies, we have identified the area around the Gulf as the hotspot for extreme heat waves in the future as a result of climate change. And that we reached that conclusion by considering measures of heat stress that combine not only temperature, but temperature and humidity. So if you combine temperature and humidity, the area around the Gulf emerges as the hotspot compared to any other region on Earth. And if climate change is not mitigated significantly, then there is likelihood that some of those heat waves and heat stress conditions may touch on the limits of adaptability by humans as, as a species. So that region impacts the southern uh, region of Iraq. The area around Basra is close to the Gulf. And so heat stress due to combination of temperature and humidity could be a significant issue in that, in that area. However, the northern and central parts of Iraq Although in the future are likely to experience extreme heat stress, the nature of that heat stress will be of a dry, the dry type, because you know it's, it's an area surrounded by deserts, and so conditions are very dry. So although the temperatures may be very extreme and heat on limits of very extreme temperature, moving into the sixties, and here I'm talking about temperature measured at six hour resolutions. When we talk about temperature, it's always important to define what resolution we are talking about. So if you think about six hour average, and that's the exposure uh, time that's needed to impact humans and human survival, you could, you could reach levels of in the 60s, which are rarely observed now, 60 degrees centigrade in some of the deserts of central and northern and northern Iraq. Although those magnitudes could be quite severe when we think about them, they may limit things like, you know, air traffic and, and, and have impact on outdoor activities. When you combine the humidity, the very low humidity, the lethal nature of that heat stress becomes significantly less compared to what you may experience in the Gulf. So there is there is that you know, complex picture where temperature could really hit extreme value that you would only see in places like the um, empty quarter um, uh, and so on. 
the the combination of humidity and heat is not is not as extreme as you may see in places like Dubai and Doha and Tehran uh, along the Gulf. So that's when it comes to heat stress, and we have done studies in which we we emphasize how that could impact human activity, outdoor activity, how it could impact some of the religious uh, activities, uh, some of the pilgrimages, and so on, and we, we published on that. The other dimension that's important for uh, when we look at climate change impact on, on, on Iraq, and that's something that my colleagues in the panel touched on, is the issue of water. You know, I have, you know, in the U.S. there is a saying that all politics is local. Um, I, I, I have been saying in some of my presentation, all climate change is local. And what I mean by that is the context. The context under which climate change is happening is very important to understand and assess. And that's when I come to talk about water conditions in Iraq, even without climate change, Iraq is facing a situation where water stress is, is a significant problem. We would be talking about it and having conferences and conferences about it, even if there is no climate change. A similar situation is actually happening in, in Egypt with the Nile. You know, Egypt, even without climate change, there are water stress and there are conflicts with, with upstream countries. So the water situation, in general, one thing that's one of the secrets about climate change is that, in general, globally, climate change is going to result in more rain, with, with few significant exceptions. One of those exceptions is the area around the Mediterranean. And that's where I was saying earlier, where Iraq is located is the, and its geography, basically east of the Mediterranean, has impact on what kind of water condition it's going to experience in the future. The area of the Mediterranean, just as I emphasized the Gulf, would be the hottest spot for heat stress, the area around the Mediterranean is going to be the hottest spot for water stress, uh, expanding from Morocco and Spain and extending into, like, all the way to, to Western Turkey and the Eastern Mediterranean region. All that area is going to experience significant droughts in the future. However, east of that, East of that area are the sources of the of the rivers that supply water to Iraq, the Digla and Frat, Tigray and, and Euphrates. And, and we have focused on looking at what are the likely conditions for the rainfall that's going to occur on those sources of the rivers. If you look at the flow in the rivers measured in, 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 in Iraq, a lot of it reflects not only changes in the climate, but also changes in upstream abstractions. And so you could, it is hard to find out exactly how much of it is climate change and how much of it is human activity other than climate change. But when you look at rainfall at the sources of these rivers, we have been able to document that in the last 50 years, the rainfall in, over those sources declined by about 16%, 15% over the last 50 years. When we look at models projections, however, into the future, the near-term future is pretty uncertain, meaning that half of the models say that you will get more water, half of them say that you're going to get less water. So the signature on how rainfall over the sources of water for Iraq for the next 30 years or so, which we call the near future, is pretty uncertain, which presents significant challenges for policymaking. However, when we look at these same models and extend our horizon towards the end of the century, which we call the far future, the end of the 21st century, the signal that becomes clear is the likelihood of a decline of rainfall that would happen only in the springtime and would bring magnitudes of decline similar to what had already been observed in the order of 15% or so. So when we think of that changes in the past and the future taken um, from models and observations documenting the impact of climate change, we and then compare them to other processes that impact the water um, uh, situation in Iraq, um, the developments of dams and abstractions of water for irrigation in Turkey associated with the uh, southeastern Anatolia project, GAP, are significant contributors to the water stress in Iraq. And so developing 
collaborative policies at the regional scale becomes necessary, not just as to address that issue in itself, but also as a way to adapt and prepare for climate change. And I have to also um, mention that uh, in, within Iraq, the issue of population, which was mentioned earlier by Dr. Yatin, is, is a significant issue. If you look at the record, the population of Iraq doubled in the last 30 years or so, and projected to again double in the next 35 years or so. And so that's that kind of increase in population from about 20 million up to like 80 million uh, people with increasing demands on water associated with that is something that also has to be uh, considered while we talk about how we are going to um, develop into the future under, under climate change. Of course, not only population, but Iraq with all its resources, with human resources, with you know, natural resources, is part of the world at that poised to make significant developments economically and significant developments and improvements also in the standard of living. And when that happens in any region of the world, that's usually associated with significant increases on demand on water. So the demand on water in the future in Iraq will not be only driven by population increases that are significant, but potentially large improvements in the standards of living and economic growth that we all hope that will happen in that part of the world. If you combine that in the demand side with what climate change is telling us, it really paints a picture where the conditions of water stress in Iraq would be even even more challenging than what we are experiencing now. However, you know, there are solutions. There are uh, technologies that could be adopted to address how we use water, how we use water efficiently. There are agricultural technologies that could be adopted to improve productivity and also uh, to have varieties of, 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 of seeds that would, would survive and would, would basically uh, function under warmer climates. So basically, heat tolerant seeds, and there is room for research and technology to help uh, develop uh, ways to adapt and adapt optimally. When you combine the issue of heat and water, the sector of the economy in Iraq that's likely to get significantly impacted is clearly the sector of agriculture. The irrigated agriculture, that's really a main mainstay of the, of, of, of the um, uh, life and of the economy in Iraq. And, and it's really an irony that the region of the world where, where irrigated agriculture was invented like maybe 6,000 years ago is, is targeted with climate change as, as, you know, as, as one of the main areas where there is risk that that, that, that irrigated agriculture system would be impacted. Uh, projecting that from now, preparing it from preparing for that future from now, I think provides the best likelihood for society to be able to to manage that transition and to be able to uh, manage it into a prosperous future. That's that's that provides opportunities for the population and 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 help maintain and sustain that that old agricultural system that that existed for thousands of years. Thank you, Professor Tahir. I think you gave us a very complete picture. And before I move on to uh, our esteemed panelists, I, I, I want to come back to you and just focus a little bit now, because you mentioned the unlivable or unadaptable conditions due to heat stress in some parts. And then you mentioned the gap increasing in water security. So I'm, I'm, I know you touched this on some of your research, but very quickly in, on Iraq specifically, do you really, how, do you, how much do you see now that we have private sector policymakers on our panel? So where do you see this significantly affecting um, economic activities in the country and displacement? Is it adaptable, or do you see it really we need to adapt even the economic activities in some, region of the in some regions in the country? So when it comes to these unlivable conditions, as I was pointing earlier, um, we find in our research that the area around the Gulf is the area that's going to really experience the extreme heat that makes it conditions um, touch on the adaptability limit, what people, where people could, could survive in. Uh, you know, Iraq, as I was trying to explain earlier, is the, the nature of the heat stress in Iraq is of the dry nature. And so the combination of, so, so the lack of humidity in the air, the dryness of the air, 
which is usually thought of as, as, in, in, as a challenge. It may be a blessing in the sense that when you combine the heat and the humidity over the Iraqi, over Iraq and the country, it's not as severe as you may see in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or, or those other countries. I mean, with the exception of the southern region of Iraq, the area around Basra and the marshes, those are would experience extreme extreme conditions. So those those parts of the country may be may, may be challenged in terms of, of, of uh, survivability and so on. Um, the sector that I uh, emphasize in the in the toward the end of my comment is agriculture. It seems to be like a sector that's going to be impacted significantly. People need to be outdoors. Uh, water stress is going to be an issue. Um, so agriculture. Um, system in, in Iraq would need to have significant investments in preparing it to adapt to this to this future um, that's coming in the future. There may have to be also significant adjustments at the macro scale of what kind of economic activity the country uh, will have to invest in into the future uh, because of just the severity of the water stress that's likely to happen in the future. And, and how severe that, I think, to in addition to climate change, will depend on on how the countries of the region, mainly Iraq and Turkey, would would reach uh, common agreements on win-win solutions, win-win arrangements, so that people could share the water in sustainable way and in ways that um, uh, benefit the population on both sides of the borders. So that's that issue becomes very critical because, as I pointed, climate change likely already reduced the rain over the sources of these rivers by 15 percent, and under the uh, worst-case scenario may reduce it again by 15 percent. Uh, that's in addition to these uh, abstractions. The, the, the irrigated areas in Turkey in, in this GAP project um, total about 1.7 million hectares. That's, that's a huge area developed for agriculture, for uh, cotton and other and other crops that that consume a lot of water. Uh, irrigated agriculture development upstream of any of any river is, is a significant issue that that reduces the, the the flow of water downstream. Hydropower, on the other hand, is not is not as, as as a significant challenge. Hydropower does not consume water. Irrigation does consume water, and so when irrigation development has to happen in any river basin, that has to be in coordination with the downstream countries. Um, and so that's that's an issue. It, it, there is a similar situation in, in the Nile Basin with, with development of dams in Ethiopia and how they could impact water in Egypt. But the nature of those dams built in Ethiopia are mostly for hydropower. Then that's, that will not have as much impact as the irrigation projects being developed in Turkey. That, that debate about, about transboundary water issues I think it's necessary to uh, have now so that, you know, so that at least each country would know uh, its allocation for water into the future so the planning could be done in a, in a, on sound, on sound, with sound assumptions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tahir. I think there are a lot of reflections that could be made uh, from our esteemed panelists. If we go back to uh, you, Dr. Farid, um, one thing I just want to quickly touch on this, you know, um, cli climate smart villages. And we see here the shift in economic activity and uh, agriculture and water usage. Um, and also some of the things, again, on the policy side, these are, we have the insights for what will happen, what we need to deal with from now as policy changes. But so your reflections, Dr. Farid, on what could be, what should be the key priorities, you know, from what you already know, what we've heard from private sector, civil society, academia and research telling us what will happen moving forward. So what are the key priorities you see in the coming years that should be in the coming in the in the on the short term that should be taken now, the actions? Well on, on the short term we should focus on the things that we can do, um, which is I think to try to stop waste. Uh, in Iraq we're very uh, frugal. We uh, you know treat our goods very carefully. But there are a few things uh, uh, with which we are very uh, um, uncaring. That's energy and water. And I think we should uh, actually mainstream uh, concerns for, the, for climate, for the environment, through developing a, a, uh, and promoting a culture where people are very conscious of trying to maintain and preserve 
the use of water and energy. Uh, and the idea to move to um, climate smart villages is part of that. Uh, climate smart villages that would be agriculture and nature, nature would rely on new technologies uh, of agriculture and irrigation that are very frugal in their use of water. Uh, there are some techniques, for example, that have been implemented in Saudi Arabia where they've reduced the requirements uh, for water in um, olive tree plantations by 94%. So these are the things that we need to, to, to be working on. Um, uh, in addition to, of course, uh, trying to reach an agreement with our upstream countries, uh, this has been done elsewhere. Uh, I think um, uh, one country, one, one system I can think of is what is happening with the Mekong um, River Delta. There is a regional arrangement between the neighboring countries upstream and downstream to, to regulate the water flow. This is something that is a must for us uh, in, in Iraq. I should add, and this is an interesting tidbit I recently discovered, that actually the first uh, in, uh, water treaty uh, in the world was uh, signed by two um, cities on the Tigris River 4,500 years ago um, that uh, required, among us, amongst the various um, elements, it's not to build any upstream dams or something like that. So uh, there, there, this is actually our, our priority. We need to find an arrangement for us to share water uh, equitably with our uh, uh, neighbors, upstream neighbors. Unfortunately, there is no, no uh, international water regime that is uh, prevalent or, or applicable throughout the world. And so this is where we have to appeal to the international community to try to work on developing standards um, for water uh, um, sharing amongst upstream and downstream countries. Thank you, Dr. Farid. And Jay Majid, um, I, 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 I hear and we know the private sector in every, probably every single recommendation, every area that is affected. And there's a big role to, for the private sector. So if we hear from you some of the key areas, from what we've heard, and again, from what you told us on those different areas, where is the private sector? What role can play? And can we say what are the opportunities if we want to think positively in terms of growth? Yeah, so I think the, the points that my colleagues on the panel have raised about essentially the institutional capacity uh, is fundamental. That's really what's, what's lacking. I mean, uh, we, we do have macro issues of climate change. We do have specific issues, the dams that were mentioned by uh, Professor Attar uh, from Turkey. But overall, is, there's an issue of management or lack of it uh, across all of these different uh, related challenges. So how to build that institutional capacity. The private sector has an important role to play. For example, all the projects where we implement, and you know, the, the, our employees in country, and we're proud to have uh, close to 90% local content across our uh, uh, employment. Instilling these cultures is something companies can do in their operations on things like health and safety, as well as environmental uh, awareness. And then from a government level, you have revising of the regulations and then enforcing those regulations and how those regulations get enforced. And uh, Dr. Mishkat's point about you know, the carrot as well as the stick, not only just finding, finding, but actually building, uh, building a culture. And, and I remember, you know, for example, growing up in, in, uh, in the UAE, uh, littering was something not uncommon across our region in the Arab world. You know, people driving, open the window, throw something out of the window. And it happened, it started with an extended public awareness program on TV and radio and, you know, about the importance of looking after the environment and not littering your country and, and, and you know, your city. And then the fine came later. And it was a significant fine. And the combination meant that that behavior was changed, culturally changed. And so I, I agree fully, that's really what, what is needed across, whether it's in the corporate sector uh, and starting with the schools now so that the next generation has that built in. And, our, and the next generation is already very environmentally, far more, I think, environmentally uh, conscious and socially aware. So I think that instilling that education uh, is key. And actually, the Arab Forum for Environment and Development has done 
uh, has created materials for use in schools in Arabic across the Arab uh, world on, on exactly this kind of thing. Uh, there is also, I want to draw attention to an important UN project that's currently uh, underway. Uh, it's a partnership between UNDP and UNEP, the environmental program, uh, called the Pollution Program for Iraq. Uh, I think that's going to be an important piece of work that's the, being done in partnership with the government. And it looks across from air to water to land to soil, all the different elements of pollution in Iraq that we mentioned, uh, and how to tackle them with concrete, actionable uh, plans. So we have these various issues that were raised. Of course, the dams require diplomacy, as Ambassador Farid Yassin said. We have law of the sea that regulates uh, ocean rights and, and share each country has. We don't have such a thing for rivers mm. at all. And so whether we mentioned the situation with Egypt and its neighbors, with the Nile, and Iraq and its na neighbors, with the Tigris and Euphrates, diplomacy is critical. I was inspired by his story. I mean, if it was possible 4,500 years ago, why can't it be possible today? It, that needs to, uh, to happen. Uh, in, a, in a kind of win-win, positively reinforcing manner rather than a winner-takes-all kind of zero-sum game manner, which unfortunately has been the, the outlook in the Middle East thus far. On the population growth, that's clearly a big driver of all of this. And we've seen, in, uh, whether it's in Asia or in Europe, a key thing of managing population is absolutely women's empowerment and education. And that has a direct impact on, uh, on the population uh, growth. And finally, we mentioned on the things like the agriculture, you know, use of water, how it is used. Uh, you can get much more efficient agriculture with less use of water. And other countries, uh, more developed countries, have already shown that, including in our region, but also in, in, in Europe. And the seed technology point, I think, is, is a very important one, which I would endorse. And India already has uh, shown uh, a miracle in terms of application of such seeds technology to get better output with less uh, water use and, uh, and more resilience to higher temperatures. Thank you. And um, again, we're sure I see already some of the questions coming in later. And I think a few of those will be coming your way. Dr. Mishkat, we've heard about governance, strategy, building the capacity, institutional capacity, building systems cr across the board. So what are the key priorities you think you want to flag for the country moving forward? Empower students and teachers to take charge of their own environment. And I'll give you an example. So uh, in Reno, elementary empire and elementary school became green certified. Not because they did something out of the ordinary, but they took minimal steps to encourage their students to uh, build green projects. Envirolution, a non-for-profit in Reno, Nevada that I'm proud to lead, uh, it's a combination between environment and solution, funded these projects, including helping students grow their own crops in the school. Later on, classes are established to help students cook their own lunch and see where their uh, food is coming from, how to care for it, how to grow it. Basically, allowing people to have a saying. Iraq is, uh, has established that it's a democracy. It wants to give people you know, uh, a seat at the table. Once you empower that path with environmental management, you will secure the country's future. You cannot do that without on-the-ground projects mm -hmm. coming from those who will be impacted, actually who are impacted right this minute through climate change. We can think about future actions, but we can think also about in, in the time action present action that we can take. Um, starting from our schools, I think it's a good start. One last uh, thing that I'd like to mention, uh, taxation. So Iraqi people do pay income taxes. 
if we encourage them by telling them they can donate to non-for-profits, to civil society organizations to receive tax deduction, that's another good way to empower civil society and use them as vehicles to combat uh, climate change or develop policies for adaptation. Thank you, Dr. Mishkat. I hear the community-led action, taxation incentives, and building from the ground up, grassroots level. Professor Tahir, you saw a lot of reactions to your uh, initial responses. So um, I think everyone is aware of uh, how significant the impacts can be. And going back, just in terms of wrapping up and closing before we get the questions from the floor uh, and online, what are the key actions that you think should be prioritized now in the coming years? Yeah, I was, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, making progress on how water is shared in these rivers uh, is, is something that could help uh, people in the future deal with, with, with upcoming challenges. Uh, I have not looked at uh, the water system in Iraq in, in much detail. I had experience looking at denial um, water issues. But in there, one of the lessons we learned is that when you have a situation like this in, in Iraq, where water is quite scarce and there are more demands coming in the future, maybe less supply, um, a lot of incentives for conservation of water, for technologies that use water more efficiently, uh, could be um, uh, encouraged by a pricing system of water mm. that, that basically uh, price the scarcity uh, so that um, you provide the incentives then for people to use technologies that basically in irrigation and otherwise, that, that, that basically um, would reduce the demand on water and would use less water. Um, in, in many parts of the world, in absence of policies that basically does the right pricing for water, um, you implicitly encourage waste. Uh, because if, if water is cheap and people don't really pay anything for it, that, that encourages um, basically uh, practices and, 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 and attitudes and culture that basically would result in a lot of waste, unfortunately, in a situation where, where the resource is quite scarce. And, and we need to do exactly the opposite by conserving it and by using it more wisely. Um, I'm not familiar with how uh, water is priced in, in Iraq, but that's something that people could look at. It, it has a lot of, uh, I know, social and political, uh, you know, uh, dimension to it. But 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 to get in order to incentivize technologies and to incentivize conservation of water, that may be a necessary step. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatah. Again, another interesting dimension: how we actually make it efficient. We give it a price tag, and we make it more valuable. And then, then the technologies that, uh, that were mentioned uh, earlier. Um, do become financially and economically feasible. And then we can bring those technologies and increase the efficiency. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we'll come. Point? Go, go ahead, Dr. Faith. Sorry. Um, uh, look, um, there, there's one point that I, that I should mention uh, in terms of the government's priorities. Now, many of these solutions that were offered, uh, especially those that rely on economics, uh, will have difficulty being implemented in Iraq because we suffer from one problem that we haven't talked about, which is corruption. And that definitely is one of the priorities uh, of the government to address it uh, carefully. Um, there is a lot of waste uh, in terms of energy, in terms of water use. Uh, much of it is because of corruption. And I think uh, we would uh, get be in a much better situation if that were under control. And that is one of the government's objectives. Thank you for raising that. I think this is part of the institutional capacity and the management that Majid, uh, Majid, Majid referred to. I mean, this is def definitely something if we are to establish or to improve this institutional capacity and uh, improve the management uh, at the macro level and the institutional level in the country, this is certainly something that would need to be addressed. Um, I know we don't have much time left, so we have a, a large number of questions coming uh, online and from the floor. I don't know if there are any questions from the floor before we go to online, so maybe we'll start 
here. I, uh, I don't know if there's a microphone. So if you allow me, maybe I'll take a couple of questions while we figure out a microphone from the floor. So I'll, I'll start with the first uh, question, uh, which is maybe we'll start with uh, Ambassador Farid and uh, maybe Majid. So examples of, uh, uh, examples of successful climate resilience projects related to health, water, and food security where government countries can collaborate. Uh, maybe um, Ambassador Farid, you have experience with that. You know, if you can share any examples that you think the Iraqi government can collaborate with other governments uh, at the regional level. Well, I was mentioning earlier uh, the example of a, uh, an olive tree plantation um, in Saudi Arabia where they reduced the water consumption by 94%. This is something that we could easily implement in Iraq. Uh, there are entities in Iraq that are doing something similar with uh, date palms uh, around Karbala and other places like that. So these things work. Uh, all we need to do is scale them up. Okay. Um, I have a few questions on energy, naturally. So, uh, Dr. Majid, I'll, I'll come to you if that's okay. So the first is, maybe I'll mention a couple and you could address them. So the first is, how can a country rely on, so reliant on fossil fuels and its public sust sector sustainability, can, how can it effectively reduce its fossil footprint. That's the first one. And the second one is on solar and wind power projects and the popularity in Iraq. If you'd like to address both generally in the power sector and the energy sector. Over to you. Sure. So uh, the first one, I'll assume that means carbon footprint. Yes. Uh, uh, so, I mean, essentially, if we look at a country like Norway, which is uh, oil uh, rich as well, and has a massive sovereign wealth fund, one of the largest in, in the world. Uh, it, first of all, it has high standards in the production in terms of the carbon footprint of the sector itself, but actually uses practically none of it itself in terms of uh, burning fossil fuels. It's blessed, of course, with uh, hydropower and gets almost all of its electricity with, uh, uh, with hydropower. In Iraq's case, the, the fastest way to reduce its uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions is to stop the flaring of, of methane. Yes. Because methane is up to 80 times worse than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, although it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere. So that absolutely needs to happen as a top priority. And the government is treating it as a, uh, uh, as a priority. And secondly, the use of natural gas displacing the liquid fuels to achieve uh, cleaner 100% uh, electricity and enable uh, renewables. You can't add solar, for example, without a stable base load of power because solar only works when during the day, obviously, when the sun is, uh, uh, is shining. So you need that stable base load of power uh, and the cleanest form, and there's no fully clean form of energy, but the cleanest form of stable is gas, and that can enable then uh, mm -hmm. the solar. And Masdar from the UAE is already active now, uh, looking to do solar projects in Iraq. Aquapower from Saudi wants to replicate its uh, success there. Our own ex uh, example in the Kurdistan region, uh, we're expanding the gas production by 50% by next year. And actually, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation is supporting that project, uh, and we're grateful for that, with a $250 million uh, finance, because it recognizes the benefits socially and environmentally and economically of that gas displacing uh, the liquid fuels. And as a company, uh, we've this year signed three new contracts with the federal government uh, to develop uh, gas in Diala, uh, d different uh, fields, also uh, in the south, on the uh, in the Basra government on the uh, Kuwait border. So we hope to replicate uh, our success, uh, and we really see with this government, from the prime minister personally, uh, Prime Minister uh, Sudani Mohammed Shia Sudani, a real commitment to re reducing the flaring, uh, use of gas for for power generation and tackling the water uh, crisis, including with the diplomacy, which we heard is, uh, is so uh, necessary. Thank you, and it's good to flag the methane pledge where a lot of countries, the impact of methane, and it's great to hear about all these efforts your company and the country in general are doing. 
So, uh, Dr. Mishkat, there's a question on the healthcare system. So, uh, how can it be adapted and strengthened to address the health impacts of climate change and uh, such the spread of infectious di di diseases or due to severe heat? So, anything on the uh, healthcare system in Iraq, how can it be adapted and strengthened? Uh, one area that needs to be addressed immediately is medical waste. So um, unfortunately, the issue of um, how to uh, dispose of medical waste coming from uh, the uh, hospitals and clinics is not up uh, to uh, international standards, so to speak. So that, one, that is one urgent area that needs uh, help and needs to be addressed. The other area that needs uh, addressing as well, the availability of water in hospitals and clinics. So oftentimes, especially you know, in rural areas, there isn't uh, much water available to uh, be used in, in hospitals. And again, that stems from uh, the idea that we have to operate on a national large scale. So by the end of the day, um, you know, for water to get delivered to these hospitals, it will take longer than usual. Shifting gears and operating on a local scale that will empower local communities, local decision makers to address these issues. Uh, from an environmental perspective, the uh, clean air will continue to be an issue unless we address uh, the main um, sources of pollution, so to speak. Um, similarly, addressing issues related to um, water and its cleanliness, its uh, availability as a clean resource is also uh, an urgent issue. One area that I'd like to stress when it comes to water resources, uh, especially with the impact of climate change, it will widen the gap between those who have and those who don't. And then to uh, mitigate the gap, a lot of uh, you know, uh, policies, management, uh, tools, need to take place. Otherwise, the widen is the gap, the difficult it is to bridge it. Thank you, Dr. Mishkat. So I have another question. I think um, Professor Tahir, you, also, you touched on that, but maybe given the challenges of water and scarcity, uh, water scarcity and drought, what innovations, you already mentioned the uh, climate smart, smart seeds and agriculture, but here, uh, what other innovations of policies that you see that could be transferred, can be used in Iraq. Other examples, if you can think of any. And, uh, and, uh, and maybe then I'll go to Ambassador Farid to say if there are any areas of collaboration with private sector and, inter and um, international community on some of those. So starting with you, Professor al Tahir, any other technologies that you'd like to highlight here in the context of Iraq? Yeah, I think, I think um, technologies related to water use and efficient water use um, in agriculture. Um, Instead of going for flood irrigation, uh, you, could, you could develop technologies where you would irrigate the water more efficiently, more um, with targeted and smart agriculture applications. Um, but as I was saying earlier, to enable that, uh, you know, you need to have the right pricing of water. If water is cheap and, you know, and, and people would not really see the value for investing in technologies to conserve water. Uh, so water use efficiency um, is, is, is an important uh, area to, to develop new technologies. And, and there are other parts of the world where people are, are doing that. Uh, uh, Dr. Yassine earlier mentioned, you know, some the southwestern region of the U.S., some regions of Australia, people have been um, developing agriculture systems and very scarce water resources. And some lessons could be learned from that. Uh, so that's that's one general one general area. Um, then in agricultural um, uh, you know technologies related to uh, more um, improved seeds and you know a targeted use of fertilizers based on um, soil fertility mapping and you know applying only the uh, magnitude and the type of and varieties of nutrients that the soil needs. Uh, also could be uh, something that agriculture in Iraq would invest in uh, 
towards a very advanced and, and smart agriculture system that uses more water more efficiently, produces crops that are needed for the markets, and doing them with the with the latest technology. Um, as I was saying earlier, future of Iraq in terms of temperature, you are going to have very harsh temperatures that are not only going to impact humans but also impact uh, crops and agriculture, and that's maybe new types of seeds that are heat tolerant, new varieties that are heat tolerant may be uh, necessary. So research in agricultural technology uh, with an eye towards developing um, and testing technologies that would uh, enable the agriculture system to adapt would be, would be one area that, that may, should, be, should be a priority, I think. Thank you, Professor Dar. Um, Ambassador Farid, there's a question on specific legislative or policy changes you think that could be applied. So if you have any of those in mind, what, are they, what, what, what would those be at this point? Well, certainly uh, one area that we haven't talked about, uh, what we haven't talked about is uh, building codes. I think it's really important for us to try to um, revive, update our building codes to reflect the new realities that we're living in. Uh, the irony is that the buildings that were built at the time of my grandparents were much more uh, weather resilient, uh, climate resilient than the ones that we that I live in right now. And so I think this is where uh, institutions like MIT could come in to help us uh, try to adopt the, the best uh, suited uh, climate, uh, climate uh, sorry, building codes um, for, for Iraq and, 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 and its future climate. Um, you earlier mentioned uh, possibilities of, of uh, collaboration internationally. Uh, uh, I think there is one area, one, one aspect of things that we haven't talked about, which will do a lot to uh, ease things, and that is reforestation. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, countries in the Middle East should embark on a major multi-nation project to reforest as much as we can of our territory. Uh, and I think in every single country in the, in the region, I think, has a, uh, its own project. Um, uh, in addition, uh, Saudi Arabia, I think, is in, in engaged in a, in a major project where it wants to uh, green the entire Middle East. So these are things that would be uh, should be pushed forward together. Another area where we could uh, work together uh, is uh, try to develop methods to predict heat waves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, heat waves don't stop at borders. And so uh, I know, for example, that there are people at the World Health Organization that are developing new models to be able to predict where heat waves are going that have a terrible impact on uh, on health of, you know, the vulnerable population. And in, with regard to Iraq, it, it'll be particularly important in, in, in cases of, you know, religious ceremonies and things like that that, that gather hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. So these, the, there are areas where we could we, we could all work together, and I think uh, uh, we're willing and eager. Thank you, Ambassador Farid. So I'll take two last questions, one for Dr. Mishkad and one for um, Andrew Majid. One, I can't ignore that, the gender considerations uh, factored into climate resilience efforts in Iraq. Uh, are there programs to empower in the context of climate change mitigation adaptation? So if you have any idea or recommendations on that? Absolutely. Yes. I think women should be recognized as the primary users of environmental resources and should be educated and, uh, you know, reached out to to incorporate their own perspective into policy making. Um, it was part of the mission of women and the environment organization to reach out to women and educate them on how to uh, engage in uh, policy making within their own homes. And basically that will uh, bridge the gender gap. One story that I will always remember uh, when uh, you know, we had these uh, workshops uh, and the uh, facilitator was uh, engaged and asked a difficult question. Uh, Zainab, a nine-year-old uh, uh, girl, answered that question, and her brother Ali was sitting next to her, and he immediately turned and said, I did not know that you are that clever. When you bring people into uh, working together and they can see each other in action, the gender gap will be bridged. So uh, my hope is that um, you know, even though climate change is a tough challenge facing Iraq, it will bring Iraqis, women and men, together 
to address that issue. Thank you, Dr. Mishkas, for this nice example. Uh, Inji Majid, a uh, big question, but maybe focusing the, the role of private sector in building climate resilience in Iraq, particularly in areas of health, water, and food security. So if you pick one of them. Very big question, but maybe uh, some uh, so ideas. I think, I, think uh, I mean, as a general point across them, since it's such a, uh, a broad uh, question, it's about bringing in uh, international practice, best practice, across all of these spaces. Mm -hmm. And the private sector has a big role to play in that, both multinationals, but also regional and, and local companies who are uh, more exposed, bringing in that best practice, uh, and as I said, training up and implementing it with their own employees, and through that, changing the national uh, mm -hmm. culture. I mean, Iraq, through uh, you no know, fault of the people, has been isolated in many ways from these standards and practices mm -hmm. because of the repeat wars, because of the whole uh, era of sanctions where the country was cut off throughout the 90s. So really, investors from the private sector have a duty uh, to bring those in uh, and help distill them in, uh, w within the country and, and, and spread them as a new culture. Thank you. Very, very clear and specific and very powerful, actually, for example. Thank you for that. So I will move back to parting thoughts now from each one, who maybe go in reverse order this time, maybe in a minute or two maximum from each of my distinguished speakers. There was a lot that was discussed. But if you give us our, your parting thoughts and the, key, the final things to be taken here by the audience online and present with us um, at the Atlantic Council, starting with you, Professor Atari. Yeah, I think um, uh, this was really um, uh, quite enjoyable experience to engage with my colleagues on the panel uh, on an important topic, uh, climate change and climate change impacts on Iraq. Um, uh, we have been recently engaged here at MIT at a new initiative that uh, aims to reinvent how climate change adaptation is done and, and with a focus on Bangladesh and, and East Africa. Uh, and the main element there is, 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 is to be proactive about, about climate change adaptation. So um, when people talk about climate change these days, they talk about events that already happened last summer or last year. Uh, the projection that the next 30 years are going to be even more challenging. And so it's, it's always uh, advisable that communities and societies around the world would project into the future for things that could happen in the next 30 years or so, uh, and prepare for them. And, and with that kind of approach, where we go with proactive, integrated, evidence-based uh, solutions, um, I think societies could, could manage to adapt to climate change, because some degree of adaptation is necessary, even under the most uh, uh, optimistic scenarios of how much mitigation is carried by the global society. Thank you so much, Dr. Tar. Dr. Mishkat. Localizing the decision-making process to allow local people to have a saying in their future. Thank you for that. Very clear, very specific, and hopefully actionable. And you, Majid? No, so I thought it was a great discussion. I certainly learned a lot, and thanks to you and, and the colleagues, and I hope the viewers uh, took away something as well. For me, I leave, uh, despite all the challenges, I leave with um, a sense of optimism. There's a real uh, focus and determination now by, by the political leadership, by, by the governments. Um, the, the three priorities uh, that I take away from the discussion are, one, uh, reducing the pollution, uh, and two, the use of energy and water, uh, and three, this vital uh, issue we raised about changing the culture. Thank you. But came across, I guess, in, from all speakers, the culture issue and the efficiencies on both energy and water. I think this is a must from what we've heard from uh, Professor Al Tahir. Uh, Ambassador Farid, over to you. Your parting thoughts. Um, well, I'll follow uh, Majid's lead and give you three points that I think are really important. Um, the first is that. We in Iraq really don't know what the situation of the environment is. 
we need to have, have develop a global or a sort of na nationwide effort to measure uh, pollutants, to measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to measure, measure um, uh, water flow, quality of water, things like that. Uh, this is something that we have to set up. I, I think there are only two points, for example, in all of Iraq where the uh, uh, particulate count of the atmosphere is counted. One is in the American embassy here in Baghdad, and the other is in Halabja as a consequence of the uh, gassing of the population there many, many, many years ago. Um, the second point that I'd like to, to, to raise uh, is that uh, even under the best circumstances, uh, and people here are talking about the uh, Paris limit of 1.5, um, Iraq will be uh, in a difficult situation. 1.5 is an average. And as uh, Dr. Attar has just made uh, obviously clear, uh, in Iraq, uh, we will be far ahead, uh, far above this limit. Uh, and so I think we, we, we really need to double our efforts to be able to take uh, all of that uh, into account. My final point point is that uh, we need to take into account climate change right now in all of our planning. Uh, recently, I had a, an interesting discussion with uh, um, Alyssa Rubin, who's a climate correspondent for the New York Times, and she's done absolutely remarkably work on, on the impact of climate change on Iraq, where she was telling me that she needed to get in touch with a very wealthy donor who was interested in funding a cancer hospital uh, on the Shat al-Arab in Basra. What she wanted to tell him uh, was that he needed to make sure that it is built on an ele elevation because hospitals like that are built for 30, 40, 50 years. And who knows uh, where the water level uh, of the Shat al-Arab will be uh, then. Um, but that's that's a somber note. I, I want to, just like uh, um, uh, Majid, leave on a, on a positive one. I want to tell you that definitely climate change is a prime concern of the Iraqi government and the prime minister, and we will spare no effort to try to address it in the best way we can. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Farid, and thank you, uh, our distinguished panelists. This was a really insightful and rich discussion. Um, I won't attempt to summarize it because I, I came personally um, uh, out with a lot. But I think the key messages here are where we started. We cannot really ignore climate change in any development discussion, especially in the context of Iraq, for what we've heard. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. And there's a lot that we can do immediately, and hopefully a lot that we should be considering moving forward. I'd like to uh, extend thanks to Atlantic Council, Professor Abbas, for uh, having us. And please, um, people in the room and online, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for such a rich and insightful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good morning, afternoon, or evening from wherever you're currently joining us. Welcome to panel number two of the annual AC Iraq Initiative Conference, with this session being titled A Dynamic Mosaic, Youth Perspectives on Socio-Political Realities in Modern Iraq. Today, Iraq finds itself in a difficult yet important time in their history as they continue to navigate through an increasingly dire climate situation in addition to complex economic, social, and political challenges. This panel will explore aspects of historical and contemporary challenges and the unique perspectives of the Iraqi youth that collectively shape the evolving socio-political landscape in Iraq today. During this conversation, I encourage all viewers to go to askac.org and join in on the conversation by asking questions and leaving your thoughts. I will see them in the chat right over here on this iPad and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Again, that's askac.org. With that being said, it's time to meet our esteemed panelists today, starting with Dr. Marcin. Dr. Marcin is an assistant professor at Boston College and a scholar of Middle Eastern politics with a primary focus on religious institutions, civil society, and protest movements. Her research and commentary have been published in many academic journals and media outlets such as BBC and Reuters, to name a few. Dr. Marcin has also consulted for organizations like the United Nations, USAID, and the World Bank. As an educator, she teaches courses on religion and the state in the Middle East, state, state building and revolution in the Middle East, and civil society and democracy. We are also joined by Hamza Haddad, who is an adjunct fellow for the Middle East Security Program at the Center for New American Security. He is also a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. In 2021, Hamza was an advisor to the president of the Trade Bank of Iraq. His research focuses on US foreign policy in the Middle East, with particular emphasis on US-Iraqi relations. Hamza is an expert on federalism in Iraq, and he has been published at numerous prominent outlets, such as the Washington Post and Al Jazeera, to name a few. Two great panelists, thank you so much for joining us. That's so let's get this conversation started. I'll ask uh, Dr. Marcin to start with her opening remarks, and then shortly thereafter, we'll pass it over to Hamza. So Dr. Marcin, the floor is yours. Thank you. thank you, lovely to be here. I wanted to start by saying it's very flattering to be on a Youth Perspectives panel, but the average age of Araqi is 21 years old, and that is the age of my students at Boston College. So <laughs> I will not be speaking as a member of this community, but as someone who interacts closely with them. Um, nevertheless, I wanted to start by saying that I have a few observations relating to youth that uh, speak to the general situation in the country. Uh, among those is the, the constant reminder for me that Iraq and Iraqi youth look a lot like youth in other parts of the Middle East. And the more I actually teach about Middle Eastern politics, the more I realize the commonalities uh, that exist across the region. And to me, that's a very good sign because it means that Iraq is moving from being an exceptional case to being a country with very, very non-exceptional problems. And I'm sure Hamza will talk about that in other contexts. But the first theme that I wanted to touch on relating to youth in this case is that there's been protest movements throughout the Middle East that have been youth-led. Uh, but if you look at the ones that occur in Iraq, they're very similar to the Hirak movements that occurred in Sudan, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Algeria. The idea here is that there are youth who are very unhappy with the establishment, but don't really have a unifying ideology or even leadership. And this is a kind of general protest that we were seeing in the region. And Iraq is certainly no exception to that. Um, and, you know, as a result of this, there's been a scramble by Iraqi political parties and political parties throughout the region to appeal to youth and to try to understand what exactly do they want. Um, because they are representatives of the Iraqi street. Like I said, they're, you know, the majority of Iraqis are very young. And so this has led to some interesting decisions by political parties. One of them is this idea that Islamist parties we don't know what the definition of them exactly is in this context, but they're just no longer what anyone wants to be associated with. So this is like no longer in vogue in, in Iraq. And as a result, you have the arrival of a new term, Medani, which translates poorly in English to civil, but it, it's secular without the associations of non-conservatism that secularism tends to have in the Middle East. And this is how a lot of parties are redefining themselves. And what's been very fascinating is that if you look at Islamist parties throughout the region, um, with a very broad definition of Islamists, they've all adopted this conservative democratic um, image. 
and we'll say that you know we're not Islamists, we're conservative Democrats, or you know we appeal to a conservative society, but we're not based in, in Islam necessarily. And I think that's what we see developing in Iraq today. So those are my you know two observations based on impact of youth on society. No, I really appreciate the insightful, uh, insightful introduction, and I'm sure you've given uh, a lot of our audience a lot to think on as we start this discussion. Hamza, I'll pass it over to you. First of all, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you to Dr. Abbas Kazim for setting this. Uh, he's a longtime mentor for me, so it's always an honor to be here. Um, kind of, we're talking about youth and the problems they face today. It's important to look at the problems that shape them, and those were the exceptional problems that Iraq has kind of gone over and now um, have shaped the youth in going forward. So, you know, issues such as terrorism, you know, Al Qaeda terrorism, ISIS, wasn't able to, you know, what wasn't successful, and that helped consolidate the post 2003 Iraqi state. Other challenges that were faced were the Kurdish secessionist movement in 2017, also was not successful. You had mass protests by the youth in 2019. And they were successful to a certain extent, but still, if we look at the consolidation of the post-2003 Iraqi state, it is there, and it's managed to survive a lot of those things. And I think that is going to shape how youth uh, view solving Iraq's problems going in the future. So maybe now that those problems weren't able to succeed, we can talk about you know, federalism in a more constructive manner for the youth in the future. Maybe the youth can also look at um, issues such as, uh, such as uh, public employment and the pro growing the private sector in a more uh, pr productive manner. And I think that's kind of the, the hope. And you know, even things such as the Constitution, maybe we can start talking about addressing the Constitution in a less hostile environment, since now we know there is a consolidated Iraqi state, and this is what we're working with them. Thank you so much, Hamsa, and thank you both. You highlighted a lot of topics that we'll get through uh, through the moderated questions, so let's get, let's get started. So Dr. Marcin, you have done extensive research and writing on the um, Iraqi Hausa. So to start, I'd like to ask you to assess the role and impact that, that the Hausa has had in the last 20 years in Iraq politically, uh, religiously, and overall to civil society. I will try to condense 20 years into a very short amount of time. But I think the takeaway is that it's transitioned from direct political involvement to indirect political involvement. Um, and by that, I mean in the earliest days of post-2003 Iraq, you saw the religious establishment working towards having a constitution writing committee, a referendum on the constitution, encouraging people to vote, to hold elections, um, basically vetoing prime ministers and asking them to step down. Of course, they had a very big role in mobilizing uh, armed groups to fight against ISIS, et cetera. So that's very direct political involvement. Uh, and then in more recent years, you've seen that they no longer have this role. Um, and that, if anything, they are refusing to meet with politicians much more than they've ever had before. And there's a reason that this transition has happened. There's multiple reasons. The first one is a bit, as Hamza described, the Iraqi state has consolidated more or less, and so they're they describe their role oftentimes as a safety valve that is only uh, invoked during crises, and they, you know, crises are over, the big existential ones at least. And so this generally has led to them being less involved. In my research on the Hausa in the last 100 years, it really is an institution that gets involved only when its own security and its uh, existence is threatened. That's not to say it doesn't feel responsible for Iraqis, but that really is a motivating trigger for it. That's one key reason. The other reason relates to public opinion and youth. There has been a large association between the religious establishment and Shia Islamist parties. Whether deserved or not, whether true or not, the association exists. And their reputation as a result has been tarnished by association. Um, and they know that. Every time I speak to a cleric in Najaf and I ask, you know, do you know that this is happening, like you're being associated with the ruling elite? They have been aware of this for years, and I think this has been a process of trying to remove that stain reputational stain. If you look at the actual data about how Iraqis feel towards religious leaders in general, uh, there was a period of severe decline in trust in religious leaders, uh, but in, since then it has plateaued. 
and I think it will continue to plateau. So there's a lot of alarmist writing about, you know, clerics no longer have authority the same way they used to before and all these things. It's true, it's the nature of clerical authority has changed, but it's not on a constant decline, and I think it's going to reach an equilibrium. Of course, this equilibrium will be shocked uh, when Grand Ayatollah Sistani, you know, inevitably has to be succeeded by someone and passes away. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the religious establishment has been through many more historical crises and I think will continue to survive other ones. Thank you, Dr. Marcin. I think there was a lot to take from that. Something I thought was particularly interesting is how you said um, they get involved when they feel as though, and again, I'm paraphrasing, um, when they feel their security, um, their own security um, is, you know, needed. Um, so that's really interesting. Hamza, um, you touched on federalism in your intro, and I wanted to ask you, what are the Iraqis' perspectives of federalism right now across Iraq, um, perhaps also thinking about what the Iraqi youth uh, thinks of their own governments within the country? I mean, uh, fe federalism is, is a new concept to Iraq when it, when it was introduced uh, post-2003. Um, I did research last year for the Conrad Adenauer Foundation where I, I examined uh, the views of federalism across three different governorates, Suleimania, Basra, and Nainawa. And I wasn't just seeing the different governorates, their perspectives, but also I interviewed uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, the um, politicians, as well as uh, I, I hosted uh, focus groups with university students. Um, and each region has had a an evolution in their thought process of federalism, and each different group has a different perspective. So I'll give you an example where Nainawa, one of the countries that voted a uh, majority of not accepting the Constitution because of federalism being one of the, the major issues they had with, their perspectives have changed completely. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're closer to uh, Kurdistan. Another aspect is that they've gone through the ISIS occupation for a certain amount of years, and their changing has changed. But also when you look at you know, places in Kurdistan like Stemania, um, politicians might tell you one thing, but then when you interview uh, business people, they're actually a lot more s bigger supporters of nationalism. I remember uh, one company um, that's, that's internet-based was telling me, I can't see myself as just a Kurdish company because I can't be successful enough. I have to see myself as an Iraqi company to make more money, to expand more. And so there's different uh, understandings of federalism that's changing throughout the, the region. Um, and it's important to, to understand there's different perspectives and they are evolving. And so maybe after a certain amount of time, again, we have a consolidated Iraqi federal state. We can have more serious conversations that aren't so sensitive about whether you're breaking up the country or not. <clears throat> Thank you, Hamza. Um, really appreciate that in-depth uh, reply to such an important question especially highlighting to our audience that this is a relatively new concept uh, to most Iraqis. Uh, Dr. Marcin, I wanted to shift gears a little and talk about climate change. Rapid rises in heat, increased water stress, climate-induced illness, and Iraq being the fifth most vulnerable country, uh, country to climate change, it's clear that climate change is no longer a threat but a reality for Iraq. So what immediate steps must be taken uh, by the governments in Iraq to protect their populations and to be climate resilient? I mean, we just heard uh, Dr. Farid Yassin talk about this, and I think that he is the expert and the authority on this. Um, to be honest, I've only looked into this insofar as I'm an Iraqi who's interested in the, in the country. But I will say from personal experience, um, the situation is dire, and people care about this more than ever before. So on the first note, I, um, a few weeks ago, picked up that book that was on like President Obama's recommended list. It's called The Ministry for the Future. It's, uh, it's a novel about climate change becoming, you know, much more present in, in society and the, the efforts that the UN will take to, you know, combat it. But the opening scene was a heat wave in India that kills millions of people in the book. Uh, but the description of the heat wave reminded me so much of a summer in Baghdad that it was really difficult to read this book because it's the kind of description that only someone who has lived through intense heat can understand. And so I think that's, um, you know, 
climate change is real and undeniable when you live in, in Iraq. The other point that I wanted to make about people caring about this more is that um, I was in the in the parliament in Baghdad and I was just interviewing an MP and you know, as that happens in these situations, you really have to wait while people come and go into this person's office. And at one point, this committee of uh, civil servants from various ministries in Iraq, including environment, electricity, um, Central Bank, et cetera, had come together because at, across ministries they were having this like employee-based initiative to protect Iraq against climate change, and they were going around basically lobbying MPs to support and sign on to their cause, which I was genuinely shocked by the initiative and happily shocked by the initiative. But like I said, it's not really my area of expertise. Hamza has done more research on climate in, in Iraq than I have, so I don't know if you would like to comment. The one thing I'd, I'd maybe want to add is um, we're seeing a lot of talk of maybe climate change bringing the, the region together, different states. You know, we failed to build uh, strong political alliances, strong economic alliances. Maybe climate change is a thing that brings the state together. But I'm a little worried about there's actually going to be a new divide of countries that can adapt and countries that need to mitigate. And Iraq is more in the mitigation category and countries that are more prepared, like those in the Gulf, are just adapting, because they've always had to adapt, as the previous panel has mentioned. And so that is my one fear I have about climate change and what impact on the region. And that's for the responsibility of the Iraqi government to make sure that the region is actually uh, is on the same note. Thank you both. Um, I think that really highlights the current situation to our audience, um, not only from concerned Iraqis themselves, but also from um, a regional perspective. Uh, Hamza, I wanted to shift gears a little and ask you about, as Dr. Marcin said, the average age in Iraq is currently 21. And um, I read reports that said that around 60% of Iraq's population is under the age of 25. So how can the governments of uh, Baghdad and Erbil unlock the potential of their youth populations and both increase and empower their participation um, in the economy, but also um, in the political system as well? Um, that's a tough question. I'll try to tackle some of them. Um, with regards to the economy, the one, the one nice thing about Iraq being so behind everyone is they don't need to reinvent the wheel once. We've already did that thousands of years ago. There's other countries that you know have a more developed banking system that we can just copy, and all we need to do is just follow the steps. So that is something that is, uh, gives me hope because it's not a figuring out what the solution is. The solution is in front of us. But we are a very youthful country, uh, a growing population. We went from 27 million in 2003 to over 40 million now. We actually do need some outside of the box thinking of addressing uh, youth involvement uh, economically, financially. Um, it's gonna, it's, at the moment, things are, can be quieted because there is a lot of money flow going around in Iraq. But the moment that things become more difficult, and we saw just this past year, the moment uh, we started seeing less U.S. dollars in the market, just how difficult it became for many people, including uh, civil society organizations that get a lot of support from foreign countries in U.S. dollars, or uh, local Iraqis that are staffed at international organizations and embassies and UN, uh, UN missions getting paid in U.S. dollars. So the system is vulnerable, but it's going to need a lot of outside thinking, and I mean, this is maybe something where we can focus. And what's nice is that, again, we're not, fo we're not worried about terrorism. We're not worried about, um, uh, about whether the country can be sustained or not. So at, at least the hope I have is that we can put our efforts behind you know, having these thoughts of inclu inclu including uh, youth and in, uh, being employed in, outside of the public sector, for example. Certainly. Certainly. And um, I see a good question on entrepreneurship, so we'll get uh, to that in the open Q&A. Uh, but Dr. Marcin, I know uh, you've done work on uh, protests, movements, uh, democracy. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about democratization. Mm -hmm. um, what are Iraq's prospects for democratization, and what role does Iraqi civil society play um, in this process? I mean, excellent question, one that I love answering, albeit a bit controversially, because I am one of the few people who don't have, doesn't have a very somber view of, uh, of Iraq's progress on this front. I wrote a very long article for the Journal of Democracy laying out the reasons that I think 
Iraq is not as bad as people think it is when it comes to democratic institutions, but it could be a lot better. Um, and my reasons for saying that is I've looked at a lot of indicators on key aspects of democracy, and I'm comparing it to the very low bar of the region that we inhabit, which you know isn't the most uh, liberal democratic region in the world, but you have to start somewhere, right? Um, and my key hope is that Iraq maintains the minimal institutions we have that do work. Key among them is that we do have uh, we have new political parties that are able to run. This isn't the case everywhere else. There's so much pre-electoral manipulation occurring in many of the um, generally sham democracies in the region that have authoritarian elections. Uh, they frequently keep people from keep parties from running. And in Iraq, more or less, a lot of the protest-based parties that evolved in 2019 have been able to run for office, and a few of them have made it to parliament. Now, of course, this isn't an entirely rosy picture. There's other forms of pre-electoral manipulation. There's a lot of predation on activists. There's also the case in any country, including the US, uh, the fact that money is a key actor in any election. You know, People can only campaign in so far as they have uh, access to resources. But this is where I think civil society and democracy are truly strongly linked in the long run. There is a lot of thought behind the, the theory that civil society breeds democracy, and it does so by two things. The first mechanism is that what it does is it gives people the skills that they can later translate into like advocacy skills or even you know skills to run for office. And the other thing is that it provides a general basic education and kind of a rallying cry for the population. Um, and in Narak's case, we do see a, you know, a civil society that is growing and learning. I think the main problem with it is that when in 2003, in the age of the occupation, there was a lot of money funneled into organizations. And so it led to the creation of a lot of dependent organizations and worse yet, ghost organizations. So we have a lot of learning for learning to do when it comes to sustainable NGOs. Uh, but there has been an evolution of NGOs and civil society organizations in Iraq. Uh, there's you know, at least 4,000 registered. I will tell you though, you know, a quarter of them are probably actually functioning. And many of them are functioning as you know, tied to a political party or an entity, there is a very uh, strong inclination among people who fail to make it to parliament to go start a civil society organization and using it as an advertising campaign. Uh, but in general, like I said in the beginning, I think these are pretty ordinary problems and not extraordinarily crippling problems. Um, and as Hamza said, there are problems that have faced other contexts before, so there is learning to be done. Thank you, Dr. Marcin. Um, Staying on a somewhat similar topic, Hamza, I wanted to ask, um, as mentioned in my intro, a lot of um, complex political dynamics across Iraq. But specifically, I wanted to ask you, what is, what would you say is Baghdad's position on the current political dynamics um, in the KRG? Good question. This is one that is being asked and talked a lot about in DC, um, and it's, uh, we're at a different stage in that relationship between uh, the Kurdistan region and the federal government in Baghdad. Um, previously, we've seen a very strong Kurdistan regional government um, with the weaker Baghdad. We're now looking at a stronger Baghdad with the weaker Kurdistan regional government. Um, and so a lot of people have come to assume that, you know, this is the new trend, this is what we want to see. But we haven't really, we haven't seen, again, in the past 20 years, these governments play by the rules of the Constitution, per se. You know, it's always been about who's more powerful and pushing it. And so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't believe the whole doom and gloom that, you know, the KRG is going to, is Baghdad wants a KRG to go away. I think uh, Baghdad wants a weaker KRG, but I don't think there's any political will or incentive to, to take over all of that. It just comes with a lot of baggage. Um, and so I think we're going to see Hopefully we reach an equilibrium between the two that is governed by the rules of the Constitution. Both sides do have uh, genuine grievances with the other, but it's because it's always been a power play. Um, but hopefully we're reaching a point where we have an equilibrium. And I don't think, you know, even in Baghdad, they're just as divided politically as the KRG. You've got pl powerful political parties in Baghdad that are more aligned with the KDP. You've got powerful political parties that are more aligned with the PUK. Because if it really was just Baghdad wants to, to gobble up the KRG, it could have easily just you know, paid the public salaries of those in Qasidah and truly 
put an end to the Kurdistan regional government. But we haven't seen that happen just yet. Thank you, uh, Hamza. And um, a quick follow-up on that, because I do agree that there would be, um, in a perfect scenario, um, maybe as an optimist, that there is that equilibrium. How realistic do you think that equilibrium is, um, you know, where we could see that? And um, like, how long do you think it would take, potentially, for us to see um, something like that, an equilibrium between both governments? I think it's going to take time till after the political parties in the Kurdistan region are, are settled. I mean, we saw just how messy of a transition it was from Mam Jalal after he passed away in 2017. You know, it's till 2023 till that party was really uh, stabilized. And again, it was a battle between cousins, and we're likely to see the same scenario happen with the KDP. And so I don't see that situation um, you know, a clear-cut rules-based federalist state until we have, we know who we're talking with in the KDP, in the PUK, and then we'll see a clearer photo picture. Thank you, Hamza. Uh, Dr. Marcin, um, we're four, four years removed from the Tashreen protests. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the legacy of these protests are? Yeah, I mean, the protests, I think, left behind three things. The first one is that they created this uh, latent accountability mechanism that is ingrained in the mind of every Iraqi politician, that there is a certain level of public grievance that will boil into the streets and that will actually stop uh, politics from continuing. That can bring down a prime minister, as we saw. So. Elections are typically the means of accountability, but in Iraq's case, the voter turnout is so low due to various factors that protests, in a way, became an accountability mechanism. And I've noticed this with the way MPs in this current government behave and talk. They keep talking about a service government, um, very much designed to placate the public and make sure that they don't have those grievances that caused everything to unravel in 2019. The second legacy is the establishment of the protest-based political parties. You know, there's a handful of them, different levels of organization and slightly different uh, ideologies. Um, and with a limited degree of success in making it to parliament and not being co-opted, I mean, I think the final count of who's left standing on their own two feet that is, hasn't been co-opted by uh, an entrenched traditional political party is lower than we had hoped for. But I think it's important to learn how to navigate in parliament uh, for, for younger people and for people who are from civil society, for protesters. This is an important development, and it just, it just has to happen. The only challenge here is that I've noticed that constituents of these protest-based parties pull them towards patronage. Like They also think that these parties should be engaged in patronage. And this has created mixed incentives for them when they try to run again and to get more votes. Because you know they want to behave by these ideals that they believe the system should change in this way. But at the same time, people only vote for them if they deliver particular goods and services. So this is the system we're stuck in. But like I said, a little bit of progress is better than no progress at all. Um, but I think a third and slightly more somber legacy of the protest movement is this constant reminder that a legacy of violence and the deterioration of freedom of speech should always be on people's minds. One of the reasons I said that Iraq was not in a bad place in, in the previous question and in this article is because for a long time there was a decent amount of freedom of speech in Iraq, but I've seen an alarming decline of that starting you know, with the, with the protest movement, but going and increasing under the leadership of Mustafa al-Qadami, frankly, um, and not really being rescinded by the current administration either. A lot of these policies continue to stay in place. And the issue with freedom of speech is once you lose a little bit of it, it's not, you're never going to get that back easily. So you should really protect what you have. Thank you, Dr. Marcin, um, for that uh, extensive outlook. Um, Hamza, for the final question before I take some questions from the audience. And again, please, uh, whether you're in person or you're online, please go to askac.org and leave us some questions. Um, Hamza, so for the final question for me, um, it's been a year for Prime Minister uh, Sudani in Iraq. Uh, what is your assessment of the performance of his government thus far? Um, Having low expectations, they're good, but you know, unfortunately, we've become accustomed to having lower expectations every time we have a newer government. Um, I will uh, mention that Sajad Jihad, who's a fellow at the Century Foundation, wrote a great article today that does assess uh, Sudanese government in its first year that I recommend reading. But one of the things that we both agree on is that 
he's not, you know, things are going smoothly, which means that he's not really going after the, the deep issues we have, like, you know, upsetting the political elite with regards to corruption, for example, which is what keeping things are. I mean, it might be better than the, the previous government that talked the talk but didn't walk the walk. I don't know. But at the, as an Iraqi, I, I think it's, uh, it's been uh, underwhelming. But maybe we need a bit of stability before we can tackle these challenges. Thank you so much um, for that um, overview of um, you know, the one-year outlook on Prime Minister Sudani. Um, OK, so I'm going to look to the audience now for questions. Again, askac.org. Um, so um, I have two questions on the economy. I'll pose them to both of you guys. Um, let's go one at a time. Um, so from a great colleague, um, what are the key recent changes in Iraq's economy? And how are they impacting youth employment and economic empowerment, uh, particularly among uh, women, the youth, um, and especially those two um, from marginalized groups? So I'll pose that maybe to Hamza first, um, and then Dr. Marcin after. I unfortunately don't see much that's going on. Again, we're, we're getting bigger budgets, so that the state itself can maybe employ more women, employ more youth that are graduating. But it's not the economy that is ideal or sustainable in the long run. And that is an issue that we have. Um, you know, we're struggling to get people to, to get bank accounts in Iraq, you know? You're not, the only ones that usually get it are those that ended up getting a public sector job, giving people more incentive to join the public sector, or if any normal person wants to go open an account, it is very difficult. Um, our laws with regards to bank accounts for children are archaic. Um, barely anyone is taking or opening an account there. So people, the youth aren't really learning basic uh, banking skills till they're 18. And usually, it's, they're not entering the banking system in Iraq unless they're in the public government. So it's, it's, it's not looking too bright in that aspect, to be honest. I don't have too much to add, only that a lot of the suggested reforms talk about decreasing public sector employment. And I always try to highlight that one of the biggest employers for women is the public sector for many reasons. So that's something that we have to think about deeply, because it can create a lot of loss of employment if we pursue that. Thank you uh, both. And um, another question for both of you guys related to um, entrepreneurship specifically, uh, but with a bit of a change. So the question says, how can Iraq's youth entrepreneurs leverage recent economic changes to create new businesses and jobs that help to mitigate climate change and adapt to its impacts? Tough question. Um, do sure. you want to take it on? Oh, I mean, it's a really tough question. I study religion and civil society. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of the businesses that I know in Baghdad. Um, there's a handful of businesses that are very, you know, eco-friendly in this like modern hip sense, um, and I think those only exist because the people behind them are a you know, an upper middle class urban educated elite who are interested in these in these kinds of endeavors. So I think in many ways, this hasn't really trickled down to really Iraq's basic economic level and its basic like, working class level. Um, but like I said, everything is a good sign. Like if there is interest in building these kinds of in, in entrepreneurship and in you know eco-friendly green entrepreneurship, that's always a positive thing. But I do like to highlight that a lot of what we see on social media, a lot of what we see in news articles that are written in English, tends to privilege the the points of view of the urban uh, elite who have you know traveled to the West and have like been interested in these ideas, and not of like the many Iraqis who are young and unemployed. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcin. And apologies uh, that you had to go a little bit outside of your expertise for that one. Um, OK, um, so some good questions are coming in. Um, in what ways um, has or is social media and digital technology impacting the political engagement and activism of uh, Iraqi um, and Kurdish youth? Um, how involved are they in local and national politics? And I pose that to either one of you, but maybe um, in a second, Hamza, you can go first. Um, it plays a big role. Um, sadly, there's actually many Iraqi politicians that probably spend too much time on social media. 
than doing uh, the things they're supposed to do. <laughs> and so I will say it does have an influence on, on the public discourse. Um, and it is, it, is, uh, it is important for Iraq to keep that. But at the same time, like very naturally, like here in the West, we see kind of tribalism that does develop because of how open it is. And we start to have echo chambers. And I think that's where we need to kind of go back to the more simpler ways of having dialogue and give, getting different voices to speak with one another. Um, that's important. So social media is good. But Iraq is, again, not, it's the challenges it faces with social media is no different to the other countries. It just maybe has a bit more freedom of speech than other countries in the region. But that, is, that has changed because of Tishreen. Um, we have started seeing people that get targeted um, for what they say and have to be careful of what they say, and which is unfortunate. Um, you gave a great answer. The only thing that I would add to that is that I've noticed a very alarming level of misinformation on Iraqi social media and also a decline, like everywhere else in the world, in, um, in traditional media. I think the only news channel that people still will kind of watch is the Iraqi state news channel. But everything else, everyone will immediately tell you which party is behind it and you know the various reasons it's biased, which makes you think, oh, they're very aware of where they're consuming their news from. But at the same time, you can see a lot of just genuinely like false articles circulating on, on Iraqi social media. It's also always interesting what's, uh, what's trending in Iraq. I think a lot of people pay attention to Twitter, but Twitter isn't the preferred space for most Iraqis anyway. Thank you both. Um, again, another challenging question. Um, <laughs> keep these them are great coming. questions. Please keep them coming. Askac.org. Um, but um, Hamza, I think a question for you. Um, what are the views of constitutional reform across the country? Um, is this something um, you know, Iraqis, and particularly the youth, uh, would like to see reformed? Um, or is this something that might not even be on their radar in terms of all the other stuff that they're dealing with? How high is it in, in terms of priority for them? I mean, I was in Baghdad during the Tishreem protests. And I do remember a lot of youth talking about the need to have constitutional amendments. Um, but again, as I was speaking with, with a friend just yesterday about with regards to the Constitution, we haven't seen a lot of articles being implemented for us to really judge it. Um, that's one. The other aspect is I just think uh, a, lot of, a lot of you don't understand just how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. I mean, once you do, you're opening Pandora's box, because there's a lot of things inside there that are good, that we want to keep, that we, you could potentially lose. For example, the first one that comes to mind is, this is the only constitution in the world that recognizes its Kurdish region. You know, the Kurdistan region is involved there. If you open the, the box of amending that constitution, um, and we're talking at a time where the KRG is weaker than ever, then you open yourself up as a risk of maybe that's the way we do lose um, the Kurdistan region and federalism. But that doesn't mean we have to ignore all the other issues that, that should and need to be addressed. But I think maybe we should give it a shot first by implementing it before we think of uh, amending it. Thank you, Hamza. Um, great questions coming in. Um, Dr. Marcin, I think a question for you. What opportunities and barriers do young Iraqis face when trying to engage in politics and, and social change mm -hmm. in their country? Really good question. So there's very practical obstacles. Um, and let's just say that engagement in politics is wanting to advocate for a new political party and be part of it, just as an example. The first obstacle you're going to face is, depending on if you're a woman or not, uh, whether your immediate society will be open to your activity in, in politics. So I've talked to a lot of uh, women who ran for office for the first time, but also their support team, which tends to also be women because they'll hire their friends or not hire, their friends will volunteer with them. And there's a lot of reputational stains for them in a lot of these communities uh, for you know, engaging in door-to-door -door campaigning and things like that. And they're also under a lot of uh, scrutiny and attention from parties that find them to be potentially threatening. And the way that women are threatened in Iraq is a lot different um, than the way that men are threatened. I remember Ala Talabani actually saying that you know women are are threatened with their reputation. That's that's the whether they're you know as high ranking as her or whether they're new to this to this game. So that's particularly you know relating to political activity for women. I think in general, you know, in addition to the very typical factors of money and time. 
uh, which uh, confront anyone else. There is also certain developing red lines in Iraq where they can't talk about certain topics or if they're seen as any, you know, potentially threatening in any way, they might come to physical harm um, or just intimidation. And I've talked to a lot of people who have gone through and I asked, why hasn't this stopped you, you know? Because many people have told me, we don't want to participate in politics. We don't want to run for office because we're genuinely afraid of, of the repercussions. You know, we've heard about so-and-so activists getting uh, arrested or kidnapped, sorry, or, um, <laughs> It's a Freudian slip, or um, uh, you know, hurt in, in some way. And the ones who do end up doing it say that they did get a lot of um, threats, and their families were threatened, etc. But they also had their own private security networks in the sense that, say, they had like a tribe that protects them, or like a larger family, or they're operating in a community that knows them well. So people have to be creative about their political engagement. And like I said, this isn't an ideal world. An ideal world is where a world in which a 25-year-old can go campaign in any way they like and no one threatens their personal safety. Uh, but I do think that there are a lot of brave Iraqis, in, particularly in the last election cycle that we saw. Um, and I think the situation is really like case by case. Each province has its own barriers uh, and its own advantages as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Marcin, um, Hamza, shifting over to you, um, I think this is a really interesting question. So what are some of the key differences in perspectives and priorities between the younger and older generations in Iraq uh, when it comes uh, to the country's socio-political landscape? But just in general, what do you see a gap between the younger and older generations um, for what um, is priorities for them? Um, or do you think that for the most part they're somewhat similar? I think they have similar priorities, but the things that scare them are different. And each one is based on their experience. So obviously, the older generation is more spooked from you know, a dictatorial regime. Um, I think, especially if I'm going to look at Shia youth, for example, the Shia youth today, they're not really afraid of losing their majority status. They feel very comfortable with that. They feel like you know, we can challenge the government. It's kind of one of the, one of the things that kind of fed into Tishreen was they don't feel like we have to have this government for the sake of it because it represents me. They feel comfortable enough that they can have a, that they want to, they can demand a better services government, for example. So again, what they want is, is similar. Um, and unfortunately, that's not necessarily a good thing. Like a lot of them still want a public sector job and they want the state to cradle them from when they were born to until they die. And, and so that kind of concerns me. But what they fear is different based on the experience they've had. I mean, that's kind of a reason why youth today, when we say they're less sectarian, doesn't mean sectarianism is not ex non-existent in Iraq. But a lot of the youth that lived through the civil war, the sectarian civil war from 2006 and onwards, and so you know, talking about sectarianism in public is is a faux pas, where maybe that wasn't the case for their the older generation. Thank you, Hamza. Um, especially how you put it in terms of. Similar priorities, but like you said, different uh, things that worry them. Um, Dr. Marcin, I, I know um, you've done work on protests and uh, democracy um, across the Middle East, um, obviously with a, a focus on Iraq. But this question is kind of broader, um, and I thought it would be good for you. Um, what are the key lessons that young Iraqis have, um, have and should learn from the experiences of other youth-led movements around the world in the region and um, how have they applied these lessons, if they have or not, in their own activism within Iraq? I think the one lesson that I saw very profoundly in Tunisia and Egypt, and I think it was, it was stated much more eloquently by a, the former Tunisian prime minister, but the idea that socioeconomic progress frequently lags behind political rights and freedoms, so that when you do have a social revolution that you saw in the Arab Spring, uh, people will be very happy at first with the increasing freedoms, but the thing that will ultimately challenge this revolution is that people expect it to come hand in hand with, with socioeconomic improvements, and it never does. And that's when things start to fall apart. And I think if I could tell one thing to Iraqi youth is that this is a natural lag between these two. And don't be alarmed and give up just because it's not progressing at the rate that you think it should progress in, because it doesn't do that naturally. And that's what ultimately led to 
the demise of potential for democracy in Egypt and the demise of a, of a democracy in Tunisia. Thank you, Dr. Marcin, um, for that overview uh, and bringing in different uh, lessons learned from different countries within the Middle East region and North Africa. Um, I'm going to, I've bombed them with questions, but I'm going to give you two, two more, uh, or one each. Uh, so Hamza, uh, 20 years after the US invasion, uh, what are the perceptions of the average Iraqi youth in particular um, about the legacy of the war? Now, I ask you this because obviously um, we recently had an event uh, with you on the panel discussing this topic. Um, but if you wanted to give our newer audience who maybe hasn't seen that event, uh, you know, 20 years after, what's the perception? Do they feel better off? Or if there, is there a longing of sorts for the previous era? Um, are views of democracy generally or mostly positive and or negative? Um, I hope I answered the same way I did in the previous ones. <laughs> That's one I can't really remember as well, but um, I think there's a lot in that question. I think the youth take uh, the, the liberties they have in democracy more for granted, again, because a lot of Iraqis today were either born during the 2003 invasion or afterwards. Um, Marcin's written a great article for War on the Rocks on uh, authoritarian nostalgia. So that is something that we've been facing with in Iraq. But um, with regards to the invasion, I think Iraqis are much more forward looking, both inside and outside. I mean, just look at the Iraqi um, academics and, and analysts and writers. They, far, they have focused far less on you know, whether the war was justified or not and more of how do we rebuild our country because it wasn't in our hands what happened and we can only do what's, in, what's within our power. And I think a lot of Iraq youth have that as well, which is nice to see that forward-looking uh, perspective. Thank you so much. And I promise the final question for Dr. <laughs> uh, Marcin. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of education and civic awareness in terms of shaping the political consciousness of Iraqi youth? And how can these uh, aspects be strengthened? Mm -hmm. um, is there a role for the international community? And where best could their expertise and support be utilized? The panel, uh, the previous panel, they were speaking about getting kids in school to be more economic, or, sorry, environmentally conscious and you know, not to litter and all these things. Uh, you know, value water and electricity. And I think across all of Iraq's problems, people in theory will say, you know, we need to focus on raising a generation of kids who have Iraq's best interests at mind and have the civic awareness and nationalism. Um, and in theory, like, this is actually the way to go. It makes a lot of sense. But in a few years working in Iraq, and I was particularly working in the field of um, interreligious cohesion and interethnic cohesion. And one of the easiest ways to create a cohesive, uh, mixed, uh, ethnically mixed and religiously mixed society is to start with, with kids and teach them about like the diverse background and diverse religious and ethnic background of the country. Um, it seems like a very straightforward, easy thing to do. Should have no problem getting it passed. You know, why wouldn't you? There, it's not a very lucrative thing to work on, so there shouldn't be obstacles by way of corruption. There's a lot of interest from the United Nations, a lot of interest from like UNICEF, for example. Um, and there's a lot of individual initiatives from Iraqi civil society, from I remember the, the, the Sunni waqf in Mosul um, in the last few years had come up with this new like, set of books for elementary school kids on, you know, on respecting other religions and on like, how different Islam can be and all these things. And it was a you know, great initiative. So there's a lot of individual energy towards this. A lot of people saying the same thing, but there's a big you know, obstacle. In, and I think, I mean, Hamza might know more about this. And then the more I talk to people in the State Department, the more I realize this isn't an Iraqi issue alone. But there's general, genuinely a bureaucratic obstacle in getting any big change like this to happen. And so I'm thinking that possibly the best space for this to roll out unintentionally is in private schools because they don't really have to do everything the government tells them to do. And oftentimes, they're created by people who are like really excited at you know, fostering this new generation of kids. So sadly, this will align with like socioeconomic status, because only rich kids go to private schools in Iraq. Um, and it will create some class divides. But speaking realistically, there's been a lot of efforts. But I, you know, by various different people, I mean so many different people have tried to work on this, particularly when it comes to religion, but I can imagine the environment being the same. 
Um, and it's just this really frustrating bureaucratic obstacles to getting things that are this big done. Well, thank you so much both um, for such um, taking these rapid fire questions. Uh, I'll pass it over to you guys each just for any quick final uh, concluding remarks. Um, and then I'll have a couple words to say and then we can close it out. So Hamza, if you had any closing remarks. Um, just uh, hopefully we keep, keep on this good work here in Washington. I know there is an Iraq fatigue for many years now, but you know there are a lot of people that still care in the city. Um, even non-Iraqis, those who have some story where they're connected to it in some uh, form or another. Um, and as we've seen this past month, things can come out of nowhere in the region. So as long as we continue the focus and keep talking with the people on the ground and keeping those networks going, then hopefully we can avoid those, uh, those exceptional problems that we've finally just gone over. Thank you. And Dr. Marskin? I mean, I would happily take another question, but uh, <laughs> the one thing I've been concluding on everywhere I go is I'm not unaware of what's happening in the region, and I just always encourage everyone to have empathy for anyone who's suffering for any reason. People are very much divorced from their political leaders, so then they often suffer the price. So please be empathetic to everyone. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marcin and Hamsa, for joining us and for answering a wide range of questions. Uh, to our audience online, thank you so much for joining. Uh, please tune back in at uh, 1.45 p.m. for our third panel. And if you are in person, uh, lunch will be outside. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon panel, Iraq's role in the region, foreign policy and its economic trajectory. We are honored to have you with us. Thank you for attending and following our program today. Um, and I'm honored to have with me His Excellency Nazar Al Khairallah. He is the Iraqi ambassador to the, to the United States. His Excellency David Mack, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and former deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for, Near Air, uh, for Near East Affairs uh, and U.S. Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, and His Excellency Douglas Silliman, President of the Gulf States Institute in Washington and former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq. Um, by way of introduction, I am going to uh, their bios and, and their CVs are uh, too long to take uh, here with our time, and, uh, but what gives me relief is that everybody in the audience and elsewhere knows who these gentlemen are. Uh, but uh, as a short introduction, uh, His Excellency Nazar al-Khairallah, uh, as I said, is ambassador of the Republic of Iraq to the United States of America. And, uh, uh, he assumed his new post as ambassador extraordinary uh, of the Republic of Iraq to uh, the United States of America in June 2003. Welcome to Washington, Your Excellency. Uh, and uh, he previously uh, served as senior deputy foreign minister for bilateral uh, relations. And prior to his posting in Washington, D.C., he served as Iraq's ambassador to the Kingdom of the Netherlands uh, and the permanent representative of Iraq uh, to the Organization of uh, Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, uh, OPCW. Um, also with me, uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, David Mack. Um, in addition to being my mentor and a person I go to on the actual history of Iraq-America uh, diplomatic relations, because he was there when before I was born. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, um, his Excellency David Mack is, is a um, non-resident senior fellow uh, with the Atlantic Council's Middle East Programs Iraq Initiative. He is also a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs from 1990 to 93, uh, the Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates 86 to 89. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Mack's uh, U.S. diplomatic assignments included Iraq, Jordan, um, Jerusalem, Lebanon, uh, Libya, Tunisia, and Saudi Arabia, to name a few. He has uh, uh, expertise in U.S. Middle East policy and uh, the security of the Arabian Peninsula and Persian Gulf region. He holds a bachelor degree uh, and master's degree from Harvard University. Um, uh, also, uh, he impressed me uh, really and many others, but particularly me when I took him to Iraq, everybody there knows him. So including the president, you know, we, we were getting to the president of, of, of Iraq and you know, I was thinking that he would say, hi Abbas, he said, David, you are here. <laughs> so it was really um, uh, wonderful to, to have David go back to Iraq and we look forward to take him again. Um, uh, Ambassador uh, Douglas Silliman, uh, the, uh, uh, he is uh, the president of uh, Gulf States Institute in Washington, D.C. and former uh, U.S. ambassador to Iraq. Uh, his uh, president, uh, he is also previously served as um, uh, in, in various other, other assignments in addition to Iraq, uh, including Kuwait. Uh, uh, from 2013 to 2014, he served as a senior advisor to the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs in the United States uh, uh, Department of State, uh, working on Iraq issues and uh, the um, U.S. Uh, uh, Africa uh, uh, leader Summit. Uh, Ambassador Suleiman was Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Iraq from 2012 to 2013, uh, 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 Minister Counselor for Political Affairs in uh, the U.S. Um, uh, in uh, Baghdad from 2011 to 2012, 
and Deputy Chief of Mission in Ankara, Turkey, uh, from 20, uh, 2008 uh, to 2011. He joined the Department of State in uh, 1984 and retired from Foreign Service in April 2019. And I will stop here because, uh, you know, um, uh, we need a lot of time, as I mentioned, to um, mention all his accomplishments. So welcome. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, it is an honor to uh, moderate this session with you, uh, and we can delve into the uh, topic of the day, uh, Iraqi foreign relations, uh, and uh, both regional and, and international theaters, uh, and it is, I could not think of a more qualified uh, panel to talk about these from history to the current affairs from U.S. Uh, point of view and also from the Iraqi point of view than, uh, than you are. <coughs> and with uh, your permission, allow me to start with Ambassador uh, Nazar al Khairallah. Uh, and I would uh, ask you, basically, since 2003, uh, Iraqi leaders have reached out to the region. Um, the uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein's regime when Iraq was a pariah state was uh, was supposed to be turned into a different approach and uh, the uh, a new chapter of bilateral and multilateral relations was to be opened some neighbors responded quickly and they answered uh, the the call and, and and work well with Iraq some were somewhat reluctant uh, to open relations until years later now uh, the uh, the situation is very uh, favorable these days uh, between Iraq and uh, its neighbors, most of them, if not all. Um, so I would ask you, Mr. Ambassador, how do you uh, describe the progress of Iraqi regional policy and its current situation and um, in light of the uh, Iraq's need to, be, to balance its relations to, to all of its neighbors? Thank you, Dr. Abbas. And, uh Thank you for the Atlantic Council for this invitation with very distinguished friends and guests. They have extensive experience in Iraq and in the region. If you allow me to start the concept of cooperation, how it was developed within Iraq. After 2003, we inherited a lot of problems. Security Council resolution, border disputes, legal agreement with neighboring countries, security issue, water resources. And for the first time in 2005, our constitution put certain principles and articles, one of them which is really important, to solve the problem with our neighboring countries by peaceful means. This is why we have to learn and develop the strategic patient on the way we negotiate with our neighboring countries and countries in the region in general. And to be honest with you, this concept has become more developed with different government that we would like to have independent but on our foreign policy. We don't like to be part of sectarian division in the region. We don't like to be part of the regional ambition. And we don't like to see Iraq as part of arm race. Yes, we would like to strengthen our capability, and especially the defense capability, because we have no intention of any kind of uh, getting involved in wars, because we learn from history that war doesn't solve problem actually it's create more complication. And then we try to assess the level of cooperation between countries in the region. There is some kind of cooperation, but actually it's not reflected on the official statistic for several reasons. One of them, there is no structure of tax or custom regimes in these countries, but there is labor mobilities, there is certain kind of integration, especially in terms of cultures, 
in terms of tradition, in terms of the language. And we think that our region is the less developed mechanism for cooperation comparing with other continent. If you look to Latin America, Europe, of course, that's a very perfect example, and even Africa. The Arab leagues also, when it's been created, they set up certain principle, but the actual fact is not being implemented. You couldn't see free movement from different countries. There is no uh, capitals exchange or investment. Actually, if you look to the statistic, you see our trade balance with China, with India, with Europe, with the United States and other countries, but not the Arab countries between them. And this is a start, the concept, how we are going to create some kind of regional cooperation. In the foreign ministry, we started originally with the European Union. We tried to uh, create some kind of arrangement because we do believe that there are certain challenges in the region as beyond your national borders. We face terrorism, and it's obvious all the terrorist attacks coming from different countries in the region, and immigration, climate change, it's an issue, and actually even energy. We haven't got proper kind of cooperation on this area. So we thought about the idea and concept of um, Baghdad Conference. In the beginning, we tried to invite technical delegation up to, um, say, the beauty minister, and we tried to focus on energy, climate change, transportation, counterterrorism. And to a certain extent, we would like to add water resources. But at the same time, we try to think that we are not going to start with some kind of disagreement. So we would like to decide about uh, topics where actually create a challenge for all the countries in the region. But then there is some kind of verification and different concept when the decision will be to invite head of state. But before that, actually, uh, one of the idea to um, make certain arrangement to the France and Paris, because as a permanent member of Security Council, they've got strong relation to have a conference to support Iraq. But when we decide to the first version of Baghdad conference, and this is really important. This is also an opportunity for a head of state to sit together, and they have a lot of disagreement. Actually, part of the organization of the conference to create opportunity. But at the time, it's difficult to put the conference for regional cooperation. We put it for cooperation and partnership, and it's purely economic, because again, Probably other countries will object because they see it as initially something by Iraq and they have not been consulted originally about how they are going to do it. And we have noticed a lot of missing concept because the region has come to the stage where we need a collective security. And all these measures actually depend on trust building because we have seen it in our fight with Daesh and the support we've got it from United States and other partners. The intelligence sharing is very weak with other neighboring countries. And this is again, it's about a trust. So we need to build a trust on that. And within Baghdad conference, we try to put certain principle. One is a permanent secretariat. And the name of the conference was still Baghdad. And actually, we try to open up to more membership. And again, we have seen there is really importance and there is a strong link between cooperation and security. 
This is why Iraq engaged in a lot of negotiation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between Iran and Jordan, Iran and Egypt, and even to certain stage between Turkey and Egypt, because we felt that you cannot build security uh, without proper cooperation and building a confidence on that. One of the previous prime minister came to the conclusion that he think you cannot divide security or economic prosperity in the region because you cannot have any kind of development if your neighbors in civil war or a failed state because all the radical element will grow up in certain kind of this situation. And we have seen, for example, in Yemen, Al-Qaeda find it a real opportunity to have alliances with big tribes. And they try to build their strength while they were going in different direction. But what I try to say, um, with the current government, the prime minister tried to push forward the kind of cooperation and actually, we're supposed to have the third version of Baghdad Conference on 30th of November. But unfortunately, it's been postponed for certain kind of events happening in the region. But this time, originally, we invite our neighboring countries, except Syria, because there is a lot of disagreement at the time. And we include the Gulf Council, Egypt and Jordan. And now we try to extend it to five permanent member states in Security Council. So United States, France, Britain, and uh, China, and Russia. I know there's a lot of difficulties on that. But at the time with the first version, I was the spoken of the uh, conference and actually the most uh, question I've been received, why Syria not included as a neighboring countries, and why France has been part of this conference. And it's really hard to explain these kind of situation, but we don't like to uh, uh, make it very limited. We try to extend because we do believe that regional cooperation should be supported by our partners and friends. However, with the current government, they try to have very ambitious kind of program for the conference. One is we are now going to talk frankly about regional cooperation. So we are going to include politics involved into that. But however, there is limitation. We cannot extend the conference for the whole Middle East because North Africa have different circumstances. We try to make it to this country related to the Gulf. We try to create initiative to have a dialogue between Arab countries and Iran and Turkey. Always our argument in the Arab League that we need to establish some kind of dialogue with Turkey and Iran because they are critical, important. They are both regional power. They have a lot of economic prospect, so we would like to include this kind of dialogues. And not only that, actually, the Prime Minister tried to put very strategic project into this kind of cooperation. For the first time, we would like to uh, actually go ahead with the development route. And so far, there's three countries interested in that. Turkey, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates. But this is a huge project. We're talking more than $22 billion, something like that. It's going to be highways, railways, and oil and gas pipe from Al Fao, from the south of Iraq, up to Turkey. So that means there's a strong link with Europe at the same time. And it's going to build like the most sophisticated industrial complex in Al Fao, and seven cities through the road. And there's a link between the road and all provinces in Iraq. Because you cannot imagine any development on any countries without proper transportation and a kind of link between that. Um, 
for the first time, the Prime Minister think that energy is very critical and is very important in terms of cooperation. This is why the new government tried to introduce complete project. It's going so many of them, which is actually uh, extract oil and gas, refineries, petrochemicals. So all these kind of issues related to the oil industry will be part of this project. And definitely we are going to deal with companies in the region. So far, for example, for the first time, uh, we have a lot of contract and a lot of cooperation about renewable energy with the United Arab Emirates. We have a lot of uh, dealing in terms of gas and other issue. Part of the priority for the government is actually our independent path on energy. We are very rich countries and part of priority is actually to increase our production. And this is really important. So far we are three and a half million but we've got a huge capacity in terms of our reserve, in terms of our uh, actual resources. I would like to say again that one of the most difficult challenge for the region is building a trust. And um, if you try to assess all the regional initiative before, some of them, they are felt, the only exception is the Gulf Council cooperation, which is have more integration. But however, there is a certain period of time, there is a real shift and there is different way of looking and see the strategic enemies or friends and, and this is again a problem. But one of the things which is help Iraq, and actually this is really important, we didn't try to put ourselves on any kind of alliances. And this is why you see even the current cooperation and integration with Egypt and Jordan, and actually we go that far in terms of our cooperation, but it's not a political one. So we didn't like to see Iraq as alliances with certain group of countries against the other. Uh, the, it's very delicate balance in the regions. And this kind is very sensitive. This is why actually our government to try to take very delicate calculation on the independent path on our foreign policy. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you for this uh, really informative answer, Ambassador. But I wanted just to briefly follow up with you on one thing uh, on the development road. You mentioned the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Turkey. And these are logical uh, partners, uh, and especially with uh, the UAE, of course, is what they, um, they've been positive towards the Iraqi um, uh, regime change from the beginning, and they helped a lot, and, and the potential also that they can provide in their expertise in various uh, economic sectors. Qatar, certainly, with its uh, position geographically and also financially, uh, and Turkey, of course, from the other end. But I didn't hear the word Kuwait. And I know Kuwait, from the beginning, was also supportive for Iraq. The relations, despite, you know, the history and a lot of outstanding issues, they've been, you know, working well with the Iraqi government. Uh, where does Kuwait fit into this, this project in a brief way? No, of course, we've got, I mean, um strong relation with Kuwait, actually. Uh, the Kuwaitis have a certain initiative to support Iraq, especially uh, in terms of the investment conference uh, happening a few years ago. And uh, when I said it's um, those countries express this interest, it's not the final because it's a matter with negotiation. It depends on the partnership between those two countries. Mm -hmm. But if the Kuwait and others, because it's a huge project, and this is what I tried to say, um, there's the development road itself, there's a link with different provinces, there is seven complete cities and the complex industrial in uh, actually Al Fao. But mm -hmm. one thing I would like to add on that, which is really important, because there's a lot of negotiation 
with our neighboring countries in terms of uh, free trade zone and actually industrial cities in the borders, which is again, it's a create different mechanism in terms of taxation, in terms of the production itself. But Kuwait is included on that process. But if they express their interest in the development road or if there is any include negotiation recently, I'm not sure about, but definitely it's open for investment. It's a huge project. Okay. I just wanted you know, this sure. to be clear because Kuwait fits logically into this group. And thank you for explaining where Iraq is going with this. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Ambassador uh, Suleiman, thank you uh, again for joining us. Uh, you've heard uh, the uh, ambassador's listing of where Iraq is doing the positive performance and relations. In the morning, we were talking about the domestic issues uh, on the um, uh, climate and other challenges, the economic challenges, also some social challenges in the second panel. And uh, there seems to be a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles Iraq has to go through. Uh, many, uh, you know, Iraq is going through a democratization process and there are no shortcuts mm -hmm. in, in a process like this. It has to take its course. But, you know, literature on diplomacy and diplomatic performance normally tends to believe that diplomacy and foreign relations are a mirror image of the strength of on the domestic level. Iraq seems to break this pattern. Uh, so how do you explain the real good performance of Iraqi diplomacy, Iraqi foreign relations, uh, other than the fact that they have great diplomats? But uh, you know, I know that <laughs> really, uh, it's, uh, you know, with, with this, how do we explain this kind of, of uh, uh, performance that is really of a very strong state uh, despite what we see domestically. Also, what are the advantage or advantages for Iraq to facilitate this good performance and to how do they build on it to uh, further Iraq's interests on the economic, political, social, uh, educational uh, uh, interests that Iraq has and, and serve the country with good governance. And you'd like me to answer this in a minute or so? <laughs> you can do that. There is nothing that you cannot answer. I know you very well. Dr. Navas, uh, thank you to you. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for inviting me today. It is a great honor to be here with Ambassador Hargalla because, among other things, when I was in Baghdad, we practiced foreign policy together <laughs> on both the good and the bad sides of the ledger. And it is, uh, it is really a pleasure to be here thank you. Uh, to see him in Washington. And Ambassador Mack, uh, you were one of the people I watched and looked up to as I was coming up through the ranks and learned quite a lot from you, even though you probably didn't realize how much I learned from you. Um, the easy answer I've asked to your question is that foreign policy has been successful in Iraq because it's so important for Iraq. If you look at the benefits of foreign policy for Iraq, um, Iraq is an incredibly strategic geopolitical location. It's a difficult neighborhood, is the way people usually say it politely. But there are economic benefits for good formulations. There are security benefits for good formulations. There are political benefits for good formulations. And most importantly, a good, strong Iraqi foreign policy can benefit Iraqis. Um, it will help ease energy shortages and make energy more available. Iraq has a lot of problems with water and climate change. There are solutions that diplomacy can facilitate. Trade is necessary, investment. Um, how do you facilitate pilgrimages and tourism, things that bring money into businesses that are run by Iraqis? Um, one of the best ways, one of the most consistent ways to help improve the future political and economic of Iraqi youth is by starting with the strong foreign policy. So I think that uh, it's really important to understand the benefits that can come particularly to a country like Iraq, which is reestablishing itself a new form of government, a new set of relations in the region. Foreign policy has got to be the basis for that. Um, I'm also very pleased that Ambassador Harella said that after 2003, Iraq reformulated the way that it conducted foreign policy. I'd like to think, I mean, one of the first pieces of that was the 2008 Strategic Framework Agreement with the United States, which didn't deal with defense issues, it dealt with everything else. And I know I was in Iraq uh, in 2012 when Iraq hosted the Arab League Summit, when Iraq hosted one of the negotiations for what was to become the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iraqi nuclear program. Um, and Iraq has since then 
begun to be a regional convening authority, a country that has the ability to bring people in countries of different interests, different political systems, different ethnicities, different um, uh, languages and priorities together in Baghdad to start a conversation to try and even out differences. So these are some of the things I think that Iraq has done very well, uh, certainly in the past 20 years and really in the past five years. Um, I have to talk a little bit though about the difficulties because uh, like most countries, domestic difficulties can affect foreign policy. Um, I wrote down some of them. For example, um, Iraq has an interesting bifurcated foreign policy because you have representatives of the Kurdistan regional government serving, in many cases, sort of alongside ambassadors in many capitals in the world. Um, it's interesting that both the president of Iraq and generally the foreign minister are Kurds, not Arabs. Um, and there are somewhat different relations between Baghdad and regional powers and Erbil and regional powers. I mean, for, for Iran, for Turkey, uh, for the Gulf, for the United States and Europe, uh, we deal with Erbil slightly differently than we deal with Baghdad. And I think that is a real challenge for Baghdad to find a unified foreign policy that also meets uh, the needs of the constitutional um, uh, you know, Kurdistan region. So again, I think that's a, a real challenge that is probably underappreciated in Baghdad in foreign policy. Um, second, there is a perception in much of the world that there is too much Iranian influence uh, in Baghdad. And I think that that harms Iraq's ability to be a good broker in all issues. Um, so I, th I think that this is something that uh, I know most Iraqi foreign policy experts are aware of. And Iraq has had to go through difficult exercises to try to be seen as balancing Iraq's relationships with different parts of the world, with Turkey, um, with the Gulf, with Iran, with Europe, with the United States, with Asia, with China, with Russia. And I think this increases the complexity. It increases the ability of Iraq to act as a mediator and a convening authority, but it makes the balancing of all of this a little bit more complex. Um, I will also say that Iraqi bureaucracy not in the foreign ministry, but outside the foreign ministry, has sometimes made it difficult for good decisions made by the foreign ministry to be implemented in practice. I think about um, expanding and easing relation, um, visa issuance for businesses, something that we worked on while I was in, in Baghdad, which was slowed down in the implementation process. So this is another challenge for Iraqi prime ministers, foreign ministers, and the, uh, the foreign ministry to find ways to take good decisions that have been made by Iraqi governments, by prime ministers and the cabinet, and make sure that they're implemented going forward uh, to expand relations. Thank you um, very much for this, uh, Ambassador. Uh, see, I told you there is nothing. I gave you it, was, it, it, was, it was more than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Before I turn to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Mack, I would like to remind our audience uh, and also uh, the esteemed guests here uh, and colleagues. You can submit any questions by uh, um, uh, using askac.org, uh, askac, uh, one word, um, .org. Uh, that's where we get our uh, questions to the panelists. Um, Ambassador Mack, uh, welcome. Uh, good to see you uh, again. Uh, we, we were in Baghdad uh, recently and uh, saw you one more time after that. Uh, it's so good to have you uh, with us. Um, let me ask you a, um, a question. I don't promise that it will be easier than the question to Ambassador Salaman. Uh, I really would like to you to, uh, you know, given uh, you know, the, the uh, way you observe Iraqi-American relations and U.S. foreign policy towards, uh, towards Iraq, you are one of the people who uh, contributed a lot, more than what I can say here, uh, and I will leave it for you to say it. Uh, how, what do you think, in your opinion, are the, uh, or, or in your observation, the continuities and the discontinuities in the pattern or the, the panoramic pattern of U.S.-Iraqi relations, you know, from the times maybe you are in uh, to, to where we see it today? Um, and, and how do you, you know, in a nutshell, see this relation has been shaping up and where is it going? Do we have a strategy in the, a strategy in the United States for how to shape 
U the future of U.S.-Iraq relations? Well, you know, based on my experience with Iraq that began in 1965, when I arrived in Baghdad as a fledgling American diplomat, um, it's really refreshing uh, to hear Ambassador El Hayrala and Ambassador Silliman talk about the way Iraq is playing this regional diplomatic role. Because if you take the long view, and I had read a lot about Iraqi foreign relations before I arrived, from the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and World War I, Iraqi foreign policy tended to be dominated by Baghdad's relationship with this or that external great power, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and I would say beginning in 1990 and 1991 with the United States. So I see Iraq really becoming fully in control now of its foreign policy destiny and working, focusing on its regional relationships, its relationships with its close neighbors and near neighbors, its relationships with, with countries that can help Iraq uh, deal with its huge internal challenges, um, economic, environmental, social. Um, and uh, that is, to me, so refreshing and so constructive. And I think that uh, Iraqis can take great pride in the fact that they have managed within the context of Middle East politics to start doing these innovative foreign policy moves without giving up their electoral democracy, something that is very precious uh, to those of us in Washington who care about Iraq, and something that is increasingly rare in the region. Um, during the time when I was with you, um, Dr. Abbas in Baghdad, for a, a, a week, I never once heard somebody say, gee, I wish we had a leader like Saddam Hussein. I mean, Iraqis, if they've learned anything from their hard experiences under the Saddam Hussein dictatorship, is that they don't want to give up control of their foreign policy to an authoritarian ruler. After all, Saddam Hussein led them into two terribly destructive wars. Um, so they are holding on to that at a time when it's uh, hard, but it's a very precious achievement. And they're doing things regionally that they don't always get as much credit for as they should. Um, for example, um, the detente that now exists between Riyadh and Tehran that started in Baghdad. It was the Iraqis who brought uh, senior Saudi officials together with senior Iranian officials um, to start that process. When China saw this flourishing, they rushed in and tried to take credit for it, uh, a, a little bit like the way President Clinton tried to take credit for the Oslo process, that we had um, relatively little uh, to do with in its latter stages there. Um, so uh, I'm thinking to myself, what else uh, can we look forward to? And I think the possibility of Iraq becoming, becoming a hub for um, transportation in energy and all kinds of other ways uh, from um, the East, India and other countries um, through the Arabian Peninsula, through Iraq, to Turkey, on, or to Jordan and Egypt. And Iraq has been reaching out in all these ways. And um, I, I think this is 
It's hard work. It's tough. There's going to be setbacks. But I can see Iraq playing a greater and greater role regionally and getting the respect that they should deserve for doing that. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and just to follow up on what you just said, uh, it's true that you know, even those who probably, for personal or selfish reasons, they would like to see something like the previous regime, they cannot say it in public because <laughs> certainly the Iraqis have turned that chapter. Yeah. And even those who probably have benefited from the past regime, they treasure the freedom they have today to speak and to act and to go abroad and to do business and to do all of these things, which they could not do yeah. during the time of that. But definitely, when Iraqis sometimes show this enchantment, uh, it's because they have high expectations. And surely they deserve uh, all what they really hope from a country like Iraq that has all the potential. Mm. But definitely, um, you know, the mere compar comparison uh, is, is not something that's there. For the record, I must mention that your observations were not just based on talking to people in the green zone. We spent <laughs> most of our time in the red zone, yeah. and we visited the green zone. <laughs> and like, you know, uh, in the past, where people would go and stay in the green zone and take a taxi to do something, we were eating in Karada and in, in, in other places, uh, you know, past uh, 10 p.m. And, and enjoying those. And we went to Al Mutanabbi on Friday. So really, most of the people we spoke with were you know, the, the, the Iraqi uh, mm. uh, intellectuals and Iraqi uh, uh, people on, on, on the street, and in addition to, of course, yeah. the Iraqi politicians and Iraqi leaders uh, whom we hold in, in, in great regard. So uh, this observation is not just based yeah. on a packaged kind of opinion, but it was really across the board. And <laughs> Mr. Wethington here, I think was uh, <laughs> leading the delegation, and he, he probably agree with that. And Dr. Abbas, I, I, am, I failed to answer the basic question you put to me. Which I is, always cut you some slack. Yeah, so. <laughs> what does this mean for U.S.-Iraqi relations? I would say three things. Yes. Uh, we've gotten beyond the idea of being the policeman in the region. We've gotten beyond the idea that we need to have a major security role with on-the-ground combat forces. And both, in a sense, reality has now caught up with where both the American people and the Iraqi people are. Nobody anymore on either side wants to see U.S. combat forces engaged on the ground. What, so what are the areas where we need to work on? And Doug Silliman, Master Silliman, mentioned the 2008 Strategic uh, Framework Agreement. The focus is there on environment, on uh, economic and commercial uh, relationships between the two countries, um, educational and cultural relationships. Um, uh, I was just amazed by the degree to which the American University in Baghdad is such a constructive and positive development um, with contacts with about 20 American universities and other uh, non-government organizations. And ironically, where is the American University in Baghdad located? It's located at Saddam Hussein's favorite palace between downtown Baghdad and the airport. That has real symbolic importance, I think, and is one of these growth areas. Poetic justice for Iraq and the Iraqis, <laughs> definitely. We, we, this is a great thing. Um, uh, Ambassador Kerala, um, back to you. Uh, and on the uh, same issue of US-Iraqi relations, and uh, you know, speaking with the Iraqi government officials, including His Excellency, uh, Prime Minister um, Mohammed Shia Sudani, uh, as previous governments, in, uh, you know, from several years ago uh, until now, they do value the U.S.-Iraqi relation a great deal. I know personally, you do value the Iraqi-American relations, um, 
But my question is, you've been here since June. Um, what is the, uh, what are the priorities that the government now, the current government, which by the way, we are meeting after a one year and uh, from its formation, um, yesterday was, was the anniversary. We congratulate them and we wish them the best. Um, and also the, uh, uh, the, 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 you mentioned the, the pillars of the Iraqi govern, government program and governance program, which rest on uh, uh, important uh, uh, pillars. Uh, security you mentioned, stability you mentioned also, the economy, definitely. Uh, we started this year by a visit um, by His Excellency uh, uh, Minister Fuad Hussein, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, who led a delegation not of diplomacy but of uh, trade and economic uh, relations uh, experts and, and practitioners. So what are your priorities in Washington? What are the government priorities and how are we doing on that? And from both sides, where are we going? Thank you, Dr. Abbas. Um, the framework agreement, actually, for the first time, we start talking beyond uh, the security and defense cooperation. It's important, and it's one of the pillars on the relation in the last 20 years. And actually, even with the defense and security, we're talking beyond the international coalition. So we would like to have some kind of cooperation between the two countries. Um, but for the first time, we try to have very ambitious in terms of our economic relations. I've got specific instruction from the Prime Minister uh, about energy and renewable energy, and we would like to see uh, American companies uh, be back to Iraq. I know there is um, some kind of mistake from both sides. Uh, probably it's uh, due to the kind of contract details, uh, due to the kind of negotiation. Um, but there is a huge opportunity in terms of economy. And this is why I think our relation uh, between Iraq and the United States always, I saw some colleagues, they say there is a personal touch on it. I mean, for example, one of the things I rely on here is Iraqi community, very well established. Mm. But the other pillars I rely on is the veteran, especially when I go to the Congress for any congressman who serve in Iraq. Actually, they are willing to visit Iraq and they're willing to support the relation and they would like to see American company inside Iraq. And actually, we're looking for some kind of cooperation, not only with the big companies, but with the medium and small size company. Mm -hmm. And the most critical things, we would like to see a partnership between private sectors. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked about this before, and this is why actually, uh, if we could explore these kind of opportunities, it's not only in Washington DC, but with different state. And I've been in Houston recently, I got to go to Michigan, Soon, so basically, there is opportunity within the state, mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of, for example, solar energy. And I know uh, Arizona, for example, they are really um, very developed in terms of water resources, underground water resources. Um, and our relation is not only that, actually, it's about communication, it's about agriculture and water resources management. I have seen a lot of delegation recently where actually they came for certain program for capacity building. And always you discover there's a lot of cooperation but you are not aware of that. One of them, for example, for the first time that United States provide assistance to our water resources ministry uh, to have a sensor and monitor the kind of water rainforest, and what they expect for that, and it's helped Iraq in terms of negotiation. But I know His Excellency aware of this program. But again, uh, the kind of uh, discussion and agreement with the Prime Minister, economy is number one. And the other thing which is really important for me is how to change the image of Iraq. 
uh, Iraq it's beyond wars and Daesh and terrorism and all these uh, kind of complication in the region. We've got great civilization, great culture, great tradition. And I, every time I be engaged with the American public, I could see how they are really interested. I would see how basically they would like to know more mm -hmm. about the history of Iraq. After the visit of the Pope to Iraq actually it's opened the door for tourism, especially for uh, Ur and other historical places. Mm -hmm. I know that the achievement we gain in terms of security, of course, we are not separate from any complication in the region. And this is, could happen anytime. Mm -hmm. This is what we have seen in the last few weeks. But actually, the kind of achievement for the first time for Iraqis is taken for granted. It's lifted their spirit. The social mm -hmm. life has become completely normal, <laughs> and every time we go to Baghdad, we could feel it. And people really happy about that. And they see it as a real achievement. But again, I mean, um, the possibility of um, American companies' presence is depend on security and stability. This is number one. Yeah. And it's depend on stability in the whole region, it's not only in Iraq. And this is again one of the complications we are going to face on the near future. But I'm sure from the way I try to uh, see in the Washington DC dynamic in the last few months, that cultural link is really important between American and Iraqis. And for the first time, we have a very ambitious program about uh, high education, because this is, again, to create a lot of integration between the two society. Mm -hmm. And we are in the process of negotiating with certain university to have a special program for Iraqi students to come to the United States. And I do believe, personally, that the climate change, one of the pillars on our relation, and this is also my priorities, and this is an opportunity for the United States actually to engage positively, not only in Iraq, but for the whole region mm -hmm. in terms of transfer of technology, support certain projects, provide assistance, capacity building. Uh, Iraq is one of the five countries the worst affected by climate change, and we feel it. It's actually affect people directly. They immigrated from the countryside they lost their tradition. And this is, again, I think, is opportunity for the United States to be part of that process. But this is, again, I'm happy about that. There is a political will in both countries to have a partnership. And of course, building partnership, again, is building a trust. And this is why I think, uh, if I meet a congressman, the first question asks me, which American company working in Iraq, uh, which is, again, we are very delighted that, uh, for example, we have uh, a contract with General Electric for the next five years. We've got Honeywell working uh, with Total and, and a huge project there. And now, for the first time, they are taking their own project. Uh, we have a partnership with Boeing's, but mm. the last events actually affect that a little bit, hopefully, is temporary. So actually, we purchased like seven, six billion dollars, and we have a partnership in terms of uh, joint workshop together in Baghdad. But we could extend that. I mean, when I met the Chamber of Commerce in Houston, a lot of small and medium companies they are really interested. And one of the advantage we've got, actually, the Iraqi communities, uh, especially the business community, they could be a bridge on our relation, and we could build on that. But also, and this is again, Iraq has um, become very important to the regional security. And for the first time, Iraq has tried to become part of a solution, not a problem. And the United States actually participate on that. 
personally, I know when His Excellency there, there's a lot of negotiation, reapprochement with the Gulf states, certain neighboring countries. They be involved with us and they support that. Uh, nowadays, actually, the link with Jordan in terms of electricity is being completed with the Gulf state. Hopefully, very soon we come to a conclusion with that. So there is a lot of a project where actually United States could support Iraq on that. So this is, again, the political and diplomatic relation is really important. Exchange of visits for uh, certain officials is very critical because that creates understanding. Uh, the prime minister going through um, very tough challenges, but also part of the program is economic reforms and actually our negotiation with the Treasury, the kind of support they provide to Iraq, it's really important because we try to change the whole culture to move to a uh, digital economy. So this is, again, it's a huge challenge, mm -hmm. but that's really important on our relation. Thank you, and, and um, I'll take that uh, to, to Ambassador Suleiman. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, uh, seen, I mean, the, the main new development and progress is really moving away from the security-centric mm. uh, relations to something that involves other sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's important. This actually has been for a long time, at least from the Iraqi side, uh, a you know, critique of what mm. the implementation of the strategic framework agreement was mm. in certain times. Now, certainly, Sometimes events on the ground dictate one thing or another. Mm. But I also recall going to Baghdad with uh, the esteemed uh, gentleman in, in the room here, um, um, Mr. Wethington and, and Ambassador Mack. We've heard time and again mm -hmm. from Iraqi officials and even from Iraqis about the need to diversify. And this is great news that we see something is going on. now. You are one of the people who served in Iraq uh, as an ambassador and came back with a good story to tell. You facilitated the U.S.-Iraqi cooperation to defeat uh, ISIS. Mm -hmm. You were the ambassador during uh, those tough times. Um, and, and also, uh, you uh, were of a style that was really I liked, is that you went out and met with Iraqis and you know, sipped tea and coffee. In, in public places, and now we are seeing this again with uh, the current ambassador, Ambassador Romanovsky, whom I know you think highly of her, and we do. Um, so how do you compare the U.S.-Iraqi relations from the time you were there to today and on this part of really diversifying the relations? And are, are, there, are there any potentials yeah. that Iraq and the United States can pursue uh, on this line that would make it even more uh, applicable? Well, I, I was in Iraq at a particular time, and most of my time was focused on the defeat of Daesh. And there was close cooperation with the prime minister, with the military, with the security services, with the coalition military, but also on the political side that was necessary for the defeat of Daesh and to, to rid Iraq of, of that, uh, that scourge, that problem. Um, two things maybe three things I want to highlight about what Ambassador Khairullah just said. In his introductory remarks, he said, Iraq is a rich country. And if you are uh, an Iraqi and go back to some of my news clips from a decade ago almost, I would say Iraqis must understand that Iraq is a rich country. It is rich in resources. It is rich in water. It is rich in culture and history. It is rich in hardworking people who value education and the proper use of education, this is where you should be focusing. Even as we fight against ISIS, it's important that Iraqis realize that when they get past this, they need to develop all of these other, uh, the richness of the country, the culture, and the economy. Um, and I think that is particularly under the current government, honestly, to my surprise. Um, First, Ambassador Romanowski went out with a very different message to Iraqis. She started talking about climate change, water resources, and things that were available uh, in, uh, through assistance with the United States that could help these very serious problems that Iraqis, as the ambassador mentioned, are facing directly. Um, I also think that the other thing you said about the foreign minister's visit earlier this year, um, it helped refocus 
the Washington policy circles on the fact that Iraq is still there and that Iraq's needs are no longer just security needs to defeat a terrorist organization, but rather their economic, cultural, educational uh, needs that the United States is as qualified and you know, able to help in. So I think you've seen, at least over the past year, that coincides with the, the tenure of the, the Prime Minister, um, a change in the direction. Um, I'm a little bit worried at the moment about how the current uh, crisis in the region is going to affect that, because you've seen a number of Iraqi elements who have highlighted um, the American and coalition military presence, although it's very small, as the evil that needs to be extracted from Iraq. And I think that uh, that is for their own political benefit, but it'll be important for the Iraqi government to find a way through that very difficult rhetoric um, and find ways to convince these groups that attacks on American and coalition forces uh, will not bring uh, greater benefits to Iraq in the future. So. Uh, I think right now we're going to a period of challenge where the very positive relationship that Ambassador Harilla laid out and that both Washington and Baghdad have been aiming toward could come in for some danger and it's going to require closer cooperation um, both in public relations and public diplomacy but making sure that these programs that will bring real good to Iraqis will continue. Great. Thank you. Um, that's really um, valuable to, to recall. Uh, Ambassador Mack, I will, you know, now we have about 30 minutes left or less. Um, I would like to take some questions from, from our esteemed audience. And there is this question that I really would like to, uh, to pose to you. Um, uh, with a forward-looking lens, how to um, speak about Iraqi uh, engagement with great powers, particularly China and Russia? Well, I think um, the importance of Iraq's relationship with great powers can be exaggerated. And I think in terms of China and Russia, there is a tendency uh, to exaggerate their potential importance as partners uh, for Iraq. Um, uh, and. I would like to think that um, as Iraq develops its relationships with its near neighbors, focusing as it is on two neighbors that often encroach on Iraqi sovereignty, both Turkey and Iran, that Iraq has found that rather than looking to the United States to solve those problems or looking to China to solve those problems, they are dealing directly with those countries. Those countries have levers on Iraq in terms of the headwaters for both the Tigris and Euphrates River. They play politics with Iraq's uh, sectarian and ethnic um, divisions. Um, but I believe that Iraq is showing itself strong enough uh, to manage their relationships with those great powers and at the same time make use of the opportunities that Iraq has with the countries of the Arabian Peninsula, um, with Jordan, with Egypt, and you know, so my inclination is to say, is to see an Iraq that is evolving toward being one of the countries that the United States needs to have a working relationship with, whether or not we get along with their top leadership. Let's face it, President Biden doesn't start as being a big fan for Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt, um, or for Mohammed bin Salman uh, in Saudi Arabia, or for Bibi Netanyahu in Israel, or um, 
President Erdogan in Turkey. And yet, he recognizes those are four countries where we have an interest to have a strong relationship, a robust relationship. And I hope the same will become true for Washington and Baghdad. Thank you. I have two questions on Turkey. So one is directly to Amb Ambassador Khairallah and the other is to the panel. And let me read them both and then have them uh, together <laughs> answered in, uh, in, in one shot. Uh, the first question says, what, uh, how does Iraq approach the numerous issues with Turkey as it has established dozens of bases and outposts in Iraqi land in its Kurdish regions? Consider the, uh, the importance uh, of Iraq being downstream of Turkey's water access, uh, and, and that's a, um, an important issue, was just mentioned by, uh, by uh, Ambassador uh, Mack. And the other question was, what is the sticking point in the negotiations between Baghdad and Ankara uh, uh, regard, uh, to reopen the ITP pipeline and do you expect it to reopen before the end of the year? If not this year, when? <laughs> also, beyond the opening of the ITP, uh, how will uh, the issue of payments, um, past payments or in, in arrears and future payments as well, uh, to IOC's operation in, uh, or operating in Kurdistan region um, to be resolved? So, Several issues, but you feel free to take any one of them between or among you. Actually, I, I just came from Turkish Embassy. Oh, that, <laughs> so it's very timely. <laughs> um, I used to head the committee to negotiate about water resources with our neighboring countries. So I know that we've got a huge stake and interest on our relation with Turkey. As a regional power, we've got um, huge trade with Turkey. I mean, probably exceed $18 billion a year. And um, we've got a lot of difficult issue to resolve. One of them, security. Uh, recently, the prime minister um, tried to think in very constructive way that basically we would like to see Turkey engage in the process of managing water resources. Because one of the strategy that we try to negotiate, we try to negotiate in, in one package, trade, energy, participating on the reconstruction of Iraq and security together. Often, all neighboring countries try to separate these issues. So they would like to uh, negotiate on each specific individual topics. Um, the security issue is very complicated. And the main issue is the presence of PKK. For Turkey, they see um, this is the main challenge for the state. So actually, um, they regard it probably more than Daesh itself. Of course, we have no interest on in getting engaged in war with PKK. We didn't feel it's our problem. We do feel this is probably could be a politi political one. But we try to negotiate. And for the first time that actually the federal uh, forces try to um, uh, occupy the border from inside Iraq. There is a lot of negotiation with the Peshmerga. And this is really important that there is a gap about 330 kilometers between Turkish borders and inside Iraq. Uh, however, it's really complicated. And many times we try to establish a committee uh, from the defense minister and foreign minister and the head of intelligence. It doesn't work because we end up with a draft. Actually, it doesn't serve our interest. And we put our recommendation against that from the foreign ministry, so it doesn't pass. And this mechanism actually has been 
uh, abolish, and we still continue our political consultation with Turkey. Often on our political consultation, which is regular every six months, and include every topics on our relation. With the energy is very sensitive and it's very difficult. I've been engaged myself on these kind of negotiations, so I know all the details. But we did make several offers before that, before we go to the final decision of, of the court. But actually it's not been taken, it's been denied. We didn't want to go to the final stage of that. I know there is a lot of complication in terms of the budget for Kurdistan region, in terms of the companies working in, in, in Kurdistan region. One of the options we think of that actually the, either the companies in north of Iraq could be giving more opportunity in south and middle of Iraq. This is again, it's an opportunity. Uh, one of the options to negotiate with the oil ministry to find ways how they are going to solve uh, this problem itself. In terms of the budget, I think they are going to renew this uh, kind of pipelines. It's, it's interest of Iraq, Kurdistan region, and Turkey for this line to be operated again. And all three parties, they did realize this fact, so there is no disagreement about it. But of course, I mean, and these are kind of sensitive issue. I mean, all parties try to exercise certain pressure on the other part to see where they could come from, coming background on it. Um, I, I think um, our prime minister, uh, the most trusted person in Kurdistan region at the moment, he've got excellent relation with Erbil. Uh, there is an issue um, because the budget delays, because um, uh, the kind of issue with the stopping the pipelines, uh, the salaries for federal employees, uh, and I think by the end of this year it's going to be resolved by actually Kurdistan region giving the, the right numbers for the government. To be honest with you, government tried to find a solution. It's not a complication on that. And this is issue is very critical for us. And we felt that any federal employees, whether in Erbil or Suleimania, similar to the one in Basra or Ramadi, and they, the federal government should take responsibility for that. It's, the difference is about the statistic and the numbers and the, the method of payment on that. But actually, there is a lot of negotiation. And for the first time, there is excellent relation, uh, actually, with Kurdistan region. But to be honest with you, in terms of oil, there is a lot of issue involved into that, political, legal, economic, and personal. Um, that's make it more complicated, to be honest with you. And also that before for Turkey getting cheap uh, oil, and this is again how they are going to solve it. But actually we are really keen for companies working in Kurdistan region. Uh, I met a couple of them. Uh, they are from US and other European countries. And we try to find an option which is fair for Iraq and fair for this company because actually the federal government not engaged directly in the process of contract with them. So they, their contract with the Kurdistan region. And this is why we try to see the best way actually to do it. Uh, however, that um, what we do believe, and, and this is again because I involve in negotiation with Turkey, I know that um, um, there is initiative from Sweden and uh, Switzerland, and I work with that initiative. Um, actually, it's very interesting, but it's become more acceptable in both countries. They call it the blue piece. So in terms of conflict on water resources and other resources, to turn that to more cooperation. And this is why actually the prime minister do believe on that. And actually we would like to Turkey to involve directly on irrigation system, on the water management, and to have a transparency in terms of exchange of information. Uh, 
So actually, we've got different strategies. But as I say it, I mean, uh, always we need patient, and we need proper strategies. And we need, uh, often there is a concept I very much like, buying our security. And, and uh, by doing that, actually, to create economic interest for countries. Turkey very interested in to become part of reconstruction process. Recently, she, they've got like uh, Mosul Airport, for example. They would like to engage in, in this development road. They would like to be part of the reconstruction on the liberated area from Daesh. So there's a lot of stake and there's a huge interest. This is why I'm really keen that we would find the best way to protect our interest as Iraqis. And I, I just, uh, uh, His Excellency uh, mentioned that unified foreign policy and it is really important that actually part of the priority for the prime minister to create trust between citizen and the political system. And this is the first time actually we try to work on that because again, what we need, we need loyalty for people to their state. And we spend years actually in our negotiation with Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia and other neighbors that they deal state to state relation mm -hmm. because it's not their interest to deal with certain component of Iraqi society. Actually, their stake, their interest with the Iraqi state. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I could see a lot of success on that. I mean, in the region, there is a real realization that basically they need to work with Iraq. They deal with Iraq, their interest with Iraq as a state. As someone who grew up in Iraq, I appreciate the notion that you know Iraqi leaders uh, talk about the need to have a citizen loyalty to the state, not to the government. So I appreciate you saying that, Mr. Ambassador. So, um, and, and now, um, if you have anything on this question, but I'm not going to let you uh, uh, go off hook by asking you from a different angle. You served in both capitals, in. Oh, Baghdad. In Ankara, in Baghdad, and in, in Amman, Ankara. in Kuwait yes. City. So. And they were all <laughs> close to this question. Yeah. So I would like to, if I may put an editorial to the mm. question, is from a U.S. perspective, as mm. the U.S. is a great partner for both Iraq mm. and Turkey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we heard about mediation from countries mm. like Sweden, Switzerland. Yeah. I think the United States is more logical because of the relations and the special status mm. it has uh, in that issue. Now, I, I'm happy to hear your direct yeah. response to the question, as, uh, but if you kindly also I, I can put, put it in that, that, in that in, context. In um, first of all, I will say, since we're talking about Iraqi foreign policy, Iraqi foreign policy is going to be incredibly important, particularly in water issues. And Iraq, both the foreign ministry and water resources ministries, and this is from conversations with several of the water resources ministers I worked with when I was in, in Iraq, um, have really cooperated with Ankara to have a dialogue about the problems. Um, the second problem is Iran, where there isn't even a good counterpart for the Ministry of Water Resources, and where Iran has not responded positively to even discussions about sol solving the issue, because the water shortage issues and the political problems inside Iran seem to be bigger than they can handle and put into the context of foreign policy. So I think that the, uh, the plan that the ambassador has laid out to broaden the discussion with Turkey about water resources shows some real wisdom. And I, the extent to which the United States can help, we've encouraged both sides consistently to come to a solution. We have tried to provide both sides with the scientific technical data that our, you know, uh, that our NOAA satellites and our NOAA technicians are able to provide about future rainfall, snowfall, water volumes. Um, and those of us who have been to the south, to the marshes, understand that without the proper water, those 5,000-year-old irrigation canals are going to stop producing food at some point in the future. So this is really crucial for Iraq. So I would say the approach of 
intensive, uh, technically-led diplomacy with Turkey across a broader set of issues is a really good step for Iraqi. Uh, it's complicated because it's not just the foreign ministry, it's the foreign ministry and several other ministries. So I think that that's a good idea. Um, I want to sort of throw a wrench into all this, however, and talk about the recent federal su Supreme Court rulings that essentially undercut what the Kurdistan government and most foreign businesses that had invested in the Kurdistan region assumed would be the legal basis for their, for their contracts. And uh, I think that this is an issue that Iraq must solve quickly, um, preferably not going by not going back to international arbitration because it will affect the way that American and European businesses view economic activity, contracts, the ability to take profit out of the country in the future. And it could significantly um, affect the willingness of American and European corporate boards to invest in Iraq. So I think it is an issue that Iraq has not yet understood uh, the negative impact of these court decisions, whether they're whether they are you know, valid or is not the question. The Iraqi Supreme Court has ruled that this is what the Constitution says. But how will the government explain that and explain to companies that have invested in the Kurdistan region or elsewhere in Iraq what the impact will be of this ruling on their economic prospects in Iraq? And uh, how will it, they encourage these companies to continue to invest and continue to work in Iraq? So I think that's an issue which is both foreign and economic policy. Uh, as well as legal and constitutional that uh, the government and the prime minister in particular will have to uh, struggle with in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Mack, do you want to uh, weigh in also on this one? I'll, you I'll, were in Ankara for some time, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off. I thought <laughs> Doug did a pretty good job <laughs> of, of polishing the rough edges there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, now uh, we have eight more minutes, uh, that's great. I think I can squeeze in a question. Um, uh, let's see. What is, the Prime Minister, what is Prime Minister Sudani's vision for defense cooperation with the United States? Is the Prime Minister taking steps to restrain the resistance organizations which are attacking Americans in Iraq at the government in invitation? Um, that is from Jonathan Lord. There he is. No. <laughs> no, that's for the ambassador or anyone on the panel. But I'd love to, but I can't answer the first part of the um, question. Um, I cannot <laughs> speak for the government of Iraq um, <laughs> as much as I would like to sometimes. Uh, is the question two parts? It is two parts, and you answer either part, none of the parts, or everything. Could you repeat it? <laughs> uh, one of the great things about the Iraqi government is they understand that our role here is really to really <laughs> facilitate a candid discussion. Now, you know, no, it's I not that, answer. you know, you could, you, you could answer it in, yeah. in any no. way because we know how candid you yeah. are. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I work with the International Coalition since its creation. Uh, the first meeting was in Jeddah, and uh, Secretary John Kerry was there. They invited uh, Gulf Council, Turkey, Jordan, Cairo, and including Iraq. And I know the value of that. Uh, the setting, the specialization, different group, uh, the number of countries has been engaged into that process. But I would say that the Iraqi forces uh, actually gaining the confidence that they manage with our partners to break down Daesh and other terrorist organizations. They change that from military confrontation into intelligence one. Every time we've got meeting with top officers, uh, the assessment and need for Iraq is actually an advisor, uh, capacity building, training, and of course, weapons. And um, we have seen the international coalition extended their task. It's beyond Iraq, beyond Syria. It's going to Africa. It may be going to Afghanistan or others. So basically, 
the idea in Baghdad is we would like our relation with the United States directly, not through the international coalition. We already have cooperation with France, <coughs> with Britain. So basically, we don't need the countries participate like a couple or two military advisors. So the, the concept in Iraq, actually, we would like to go beyond that. And this is why the last negotiation when our defense ministry came into the Pentagon. And for the first time, we have seen a, a new will even in the Pentagon to actually meet the need of Iraqi forces in terms of purchases of weapons. Of course, in condition, these kind of sensitive issue not going to China. And, um, and it's really interesting. Every time I spoke to certain institution within the US administration, they don't mind if there is a re relation with China. We, we've got trade in terms of oil, their participation in oil industry, but we haven't got cooperation in terms of military. And of course, we cannot do that with Russia for several reasons, one of them the sanction. But actually, the idea is to getting different kind of relation with the United States. And this is the first time we have been start this kind of negotiation and discussion. And I do believe this is really critical for Iraq because the international coalition have very limited task. It's in Daesh, but we talk in, in our relation with the United States in more wider vision in terms of security for the whole region. So this is the, the, the important thing. Uh, in terms of the government policy and restraint about certain group attacking the United States recently, yes, um, the prime minister giving instruction to uh, interior ministry. Uh, this is a few days ago. And all, always as Iraqi government, we say we protect all diplomatic mission but also, he made it very clear, this is an Iraqi base, and we invite our partners to come to Iraq as a military advisor. So we are going to protect that, and also we are going to start an investigation if we could find anyone involved into that. And actually, he made a very important political meeting to agree on the strategies. Because I knew there is different military group, some of them part of the government, some of them part of the parliament. And actually they feel they are part of the political system. This is why they have a political calculation. They start thinking about the interest of the state. But it may be that a small group is not under control. But the prime minister actually spoke to the uh, defense secretary to uh, State Secretary, and uh, actually we made it very clear that it's our obligation to protect, uh, whether diplomatic mission or American interest or even Iraqi bases where we invite our partners to be a guest for us. Thank you very much. And indeed, the Prime Minister made a special speech about that and has, you know, made it clear that, is, and I mean, these acts are not acts against the, you know, the, the interests of the countries, be it the US or Sweden in the past, but basically it is the Iraqi government is the main victim of that accord because by the law, Iraqi law and international law, they are the ones. Let me make one point here, and I think this yes. may be more yeah. what Jonathan is aiming for. I, I honestly don't think this problem is going to be overcome until the Iraqi re government requires the same professionalization of the Hashid al-Shabi as it does from the federal police, the rest of the interior ministry, the Mohammedat, the, the, the counterterrorism force, and the military. Um, as long as these groups do not act under the same command and control, have different recruitment systems, different training, and don't have a similar system of military justice, it's going to be very difficult to bring them within the control of the state. So I think that this, I mean, this, these are security issues and internal security issues, but the extent to which any of these groups are able to undercut the policy of the government will have an impact on Iraqi foreign policy. Um, and again, it, for here in Washington, it could very directly affect 
foreign policy between Baghdad and Washington, which all of us sitting here don't want to happen. Thank you, Ambassador Salaman. Ambassador Mack? Well, just to say that we owe it to the American people and to the Iraqi people to be very careful how we talk about our military and security relationships with the government of Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. A former senior U.S. official, I believe he was the President of the United States, went out to Iraq, visited a base, didn't bother to go into Baghdad to talk to his, his counterpart, and he said, I visited our beautiful base, um, and I think maybe Ambassador Silliman got him to make a phone call, which was the only gesture that I would call diplomatically correct. That was that kind of episode should not take place in the future. And with that positive uh, note, we are 59 seconds above time, and I'm getting minus one minute and six <laughs> seconds to close the program. Um, <laughs> and so you, you complained earlier about my question on the time allotted for it. Let me see how I'm going to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a wonderful day. Um, we really explored a lot, and there is a lot to be explored for the future. We heard about Iraq's climate issues, and this is, and this year we made sure that we talk about this, and we wanted to address this because it is one of the priorities of the prime minister, as he said it, and it is in the uh, in the governance. Uh, uh, program and also it is a global issue that Iraq is one of the most affected countries but it is also a concern for everyone in the region and elsewhere. We also talked about the youth and, and the social uh, socioeconomic uh, issues in Iraq and we heard a, from a wonderful panel. This panel has been really uh, you know, a, a, a seminar for me personally to learn from these great uh, diplomats and, and with their experience and knowledge. Uh, I would be remiss not to um, thank, again, Crescent Petroleum and Majid, who flew here uh, to, to be with us and uh, flew in, 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 into Washington, D.C., and also uh, my good friend and advisor uh, and, and wise mentor, uh, uh, Abdullah al -Qadi. You are always a, a person that comforts me whenever things get tough. Uh, the uh, Iraqi government and the embassy particularly uh, are great partner to have. All of our Iraq work is benefiting from their feedback and their support and their partnership. We thank you, whether it's here in the embassy or in, in Baghdad, and certainly the State Department and the Iraq office of the State Department who have been friends. I mean, I've been here for five years, but we were friends for more than 15 to 20 years on and off, but mostly on in the last 15 years, uh, and we always both from the Iraqi side and the American side of governments, make us feel that our work is relevant and we give us the incentive and the drive to continue doing our work. Uh, with friends like the gentlemen around the table, there is nothing for me but to keep going and thank everyone for their support. My colleagues at the Atlantic Council, I'm ever grateful, and Mas'ud Mustajabi, uh, can't do anything without you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank Have you. a wonderful day.